Good afternoon. Today is May 15th, 2024, and I will call to order the Green Mountain Care Board's hearing. We have two agenda items today. We have um, an update from Elena Barabee and Pat Jones on the AHEAD model and the Vermont Medicare Global Payment Design. And then we have uh, a distinguished set of um, providers and provider representatives who will speak to their perspectives on Vermont's global budget design and the AHEAD model. And I just want to thank everyone in advance for coming and making time to help inform everybody of those very important perspectives. Um, before we get started, I'll turn to Susan Barrett for the executive director's report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a few uh, public comment periods uh, to announce and then just some scheduling updates. Uh, first, we have a new public comment period that we open today, and that is the board is accepting public comments on the draft One Care Vermont FY25 budget guidance, and we will be accepting that uh, public comment until noon on Monday, May 20th. We're also accepting public comment on the proposed revisions to the reporting manual for Vermont's all payer claims database, and that's the Vermont Healthcare Uniform Reporting and Evaluation System, also known as VCURES, and we're accepting those comments through May 31st. We're accepting public comments on, on um, an ongoing basis, which I've mentioned before. I'll mention them again. Um, any comments on the hospital sustainability and community engagement work that we're undertaking per Act 167. Those comments are welcomed, as well as comments on the AHEAD model. We're gonna hear more from, uh, as uh, Chair Foster said, from our panel today. So um, that will be really helpful. Thank you again for everyone for coming. And then in terms of uh, scheduling this evening at 5.30, we have a primary care advisory group meeting and that is on team. So if folks are interested in listening in, please do. And then Monday, this coming Monday, May 20th, we will be conducting a hearing for the Outpac Outpatient Surgery Center Certificate of Need for UVM MC. And that starts at 9 a.m. via Teams. And please just check our schedule. We um, will keep it updated. It's just a very busy month in May. So with that, I will turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. We have meeting minutes from May 8th, 2020, 20, sorry, 2024, and I will move for the approval of those minutes. Second. All in favor of approval, say aye. 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 <clears throat> and the minutes are approved unanimously. Um, I'll turn it over to Ms. Barraby, our Director of Health Systems Finance, and to Ms. Jones, the Interim Director of Healthcare Reform at the Agency of Human Services. Great, thank you. Um, and I believe Michelle's going to be running our slides. Great. Thank you, Michelle. Okay, we can skip to the next slide. Um, so we'll cover two topics. I'll take us through a brief update on the Vermont Medicare Hospital Global Payment Design, and then I'll pass the baton over um, to Director of Healthcare Reform, Pat Jones, who will walk you through an update on the HEN model. So we can go to the next slide. Um, so I just wanted to remind folks, you know, I think um, Susan kind of mentioned our very busy schedule. Some of those dates are on here. Um, so today we'll we'll do that update and talk about the provider panel. But just a reminder, we'll be receiving the um, draft. So it says near final, but it's still a draft methods paper back to the board based on um, discussions to date and feedback um, sometime next week. So probably around the 20th and then we'll be posting it for public comment. Um, and then walking through that on the 22nd. Um, we'll also hear from an expert panel on value-based care and payment and delivery system reform on that same date. Um, and then, you know, I think we'll have, um, to di we'll discuss this now, but we'll um, be thinking about a vote on the methodology or um, um, either on the May 29th or June 5th. So Michelle, you can go to the next one. Um, so just, you know, a summary, this is kind of we've talked about each of the adjustments and kind of what the required state design methodology is per the agreement. And we walked through a series um, of adjustments and kind of some ideas for feedback um, 
and and how that would kind of um, accumulate to a facility based payment and we'll go through those in more detail um, next time we meet and Michelle next slide. Um, but I, I did want to bring up, so today we've been talking about um, voting on the methods paper. Um, so staff would then submit a specification. So that's really how the um, kind of the nuts and bolts of how the calculation would work um, for submission to CMS as part of the negotiations um, in the AHEAD model. Um, the methodology itself um, is still kind of part of a broader negotiation, so it doesn't stand alone. Um, but again, the board would vote on the broader model on June 30th. Um, do you want to go to the next slide, Michelle? I think there has been some discussion around challenges of voting on a methodology that is kind of contingent on um, a larger picture and a larger approach and what can be negotiated, um, given that there's still a lot of outstanding items to kind of design and evaluate it is difficult for the board to judge the methodology on its own merit um, and also because it's part of this broader negotiation so an alternative that staff had been thinking about um, would be to a uh, vote on um, a series of principles and then you would kind of delegate to staff to submit the methodology and then kind of revisit um, you know during negotiations how this methodology would work with the broader um, the broader negotiation strategy and what what the state can then um, um, uh, you know come to agreement with CMS. So that is something we wanted to propose. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide, Michelle. Um, so we took a stab at coming up with some language and some principles. Um, these principles are based on the feedback and kind of stated um, objectives of board members. It's also reflecting kind of some of the goals that were reflected in Act 167 also encompasses some of the goals that were established by the Global Budget Tag Group um, that has been heavily involved in um, kind of de developing and creating the methods um, to date for the Medicare piece at least. Um, and so we wanted to kind of share these with you now, um, collect your feedback, see if there's any adjustments or additions, um, take public comment on them and what other principles we think would be important um, as the negotiating team kind of moves forward to explore this option. I won't read them to you, but I, you know, I think a lot of these kind of echo a lot of similar um, principles just in advancing the work of the board. You know, we care about um, kind of controlling costs, um, controlling healthcare cost growth, making sure we're working towards more affordable, high quality um, care, that the methodology is transparent and data driven, that we're working towards an all payer approach. So we're not further bifurcating um, and creating kind of um, different systems. We wanna kind of work towards a single, single simplified system, if you will, and that what other um, payment reform efforts kind of contribute to um, improving access and high quality care for Vermonters. Um, so you can go to the next slide. Um, and so, you know, we can take your, your comments either today um, or over the next week or so, but I imagine you'll probably want to think about this um, since we're just proposing it for the first time, but we'd love to hear your thoughts on voting on a Medicare hospital global payment. Do you want to vote on the final product or, you know, delegate this these um, and establish these principles? And then do you have, if, if the latter, do you have thoughts on the list of principles that we've proposed here? Um, and any additions. Um, and again, we'll revisit this topic on May 22nd when we review the updated draft methods paper. And I think that's all I have before we pass it over to Pat. So I'll pause if there are any questions, Chair Foster, if you'd like to wait till the end. Um, if board members have any questions or comments, that's fine. I have none and I thank you for that quick overview. Okay, so I will pass it over to Pat. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for once again um, having me back to um, provide an update on the AHEAD model. Um, next slide, Michelle. 
So um, when in talking with Green Mountain Care Board staff, um, three areas were highlighted that might be helpful today. Um, the first is to provide a um, bit more detail on timelines um, for the AHEAD model. The second was to describe potential areas for negotiation. And then the third um, was to spend some time talking about system transformation um, and how we might um, prepare our healthcare system um, for care delivery transformation. Um, so I'll be spending actually most of my time on that topic. So next slide. So this is um, sort of the highest level um, timeline to get us started, but then I'll do a deeper dive. So Vermont, um, just as a refresher, Vermont has um, applied uh, as a cohort one state for the AHEAD model. So the applications were due on March 18th of this year. We actually submitted ours on March 15th. Um, and worked really um, closely with the um, board staff and um, and really appreciated the um, the work there. We um, are now hearing that CMMI will select um, states in June of 2024. They had talked about late May or June. It looks like it is going to be um, June of 2024. So that's when we expect to hear whether or not Vermont has been selected. After that, there's a 18-month um, pre-implementation period extending from July 1st to December 31st of 2025. And um, that's actually a very busy time and um, you'll see it both in the more detailed timelines and also when we talk about some of the areas for negotiation. Um, but that um, pre-implementation period takes us right up until the end of 2025. And then um, the first performance year for cohort one states is um, begins on January 1st of 2026. It's up to a nine-year model. So um, the idea is that it would extend through 2034. Next slide. So these, um, these next two slides where we really try to describe the key model milestones, this is information that um, we've um, gleaned um, mostly from the notice of funding opportunity that CMMI um, put out a few months ago. And so this first slide talks about what happens during that pre-implementation period for the cohort one states. So um, if the performance year starts on January 1st of 2026 and you take um, you know, an 18 month look back, so July of 2024, there are um, some really key milestones there. And one of them, this board has been talking about quite a bit in recent meetings. And that is that um, by July 1st, if, if states are doing a state-designed Medicare fee-for-service hospital global budget methodology, it needs to be submitted to CMS. So that's been um, really a large focus of um, the board's work and of our work together is um, developing that methodology. In addition, um, Medicaid needs to um, share a proposal for a primary care alternative payment model and for the regulatory pathway or processes that um, Medicaid would propose for a Medicaid hospital global budget. So a couple of comments there. Um, 
you know, Medicaid, we've talked about this before, but Medicaid's in pretty good shape um, in terms of that primary care alternative payment model. Um, the priorities and principles that CMS has outlined um, for the primary care model looks um, an awful lot like the blueprint for health. Um, so we feel like that's, um, that's a place where we're in good shape. And then um, we've also, you know, been contemplating, we have an 1115 waiver and some other mechanisms um, that could serve as um, regulatory pathways for the Medicaid hospital global budget. So, but both of those things are um, also due in July of 2024. The next, um, you know, significant milestone that we've been able to glean from the um, NOFO is that within six months after an award is given to a state, so a state is selected um, for the AHEAD model, states would need to establish the model governance structure. And you all may recall that that's a, um, you know, very representative, um, broad-based um, group of um, a variety of stakeholders with a, um, you know, a lot of that group's uh, work is focused on um, health equity. So, um, so that needs to be in place within six months. So if awards are made in June, think, you know, November, December um, is when we'd want to have that model governance structure set up. Then um, 12 months prior to the start of the first performance year. So in January of 2025, that's when Medicaid would need to um, submit its hospital global budget methodology to CMS um, and, you know, following the alignment principles that have been set forth in the notice of funding opportunity. Six months prior to the start of that performance year, um, so in July of 2025, um, and this is, um, you know, undoubtedly our um, most significant milestone during the pre-implementation period. That is when the state level agreement with CMS um, needs to be executed. So, you know, all during this time, from the time of selection um, and award of the cooperative agreement funding and so forth, um, you know, negotiations would begin between those states that have been selected and CMS. Um, and until that agreement is executed, um, Vermont or any other state that might be selected um, has not committed to participating in the head until that agreement is, is signed. Um, also, in July of 2025, we would be looking for uh, letters of interest from hospitals that um, want to participate in the Medicare fee-for-service hospital global budgets. We'd be expecting um, to see CMS approval of that Medicaid hospital global budget methodology. And um, you may recall that for some of the statewide accountabilities, most notably um, total cost of care and primary care investment or spending, um, the all payer targets have to be um, codified. And um, so by, by October of 2025, we have to have a final, um, either executive order, and that's um, you know what the governor's office has indicated, or it could be um, rule or uh, legislation. Um, but that what it, it's not the targets per se um, that have to be in place by October, but the process um, of setting those all payer total cost of care and primary care investment targets would need to be established. So we're um, thinking drafting, um, you know, having a draft in July at, of 2025 at the latest, 
and then um, finalizing by October of 2025. That's required um, in the NOFA. Other things that um, would need to occur by October of 2025, um, demonstrating that there's readiness for Medicaid hospital global budget implementation and Medicaid primary care alternative payment model. You know, again, we already have a Medicaid primary care alternative payment model in place, um, but some states don't. And um, so the requirement is that um, readiness be demonstrated by October of 2025. That's also when CMS would want to verify that at least 10% of Medicare fee-for-service net patient revenue will be under the Medicare hospital global budgets, you know, as reflected in the hospitals that um, have um, agreed to participate in uh, Medicare hospital global budgets. So that's a requirement in order for the model to um, get underway is that 10% in that first performance year would have to be under hospital global budgets. And then at the end of that pre-implementation period, so December of 2025, um, a statewide health equity plan would need to be finalized. And, um, that, again, is a key um, part of the work of that model governance structure. So as I mentioned before, um, pretty busy time for states that get selected in that pre-implementation period. Next slide. So this, um, this slide talks about what happens after that, performance year one, two, three, and beyond. Uh, so for performance year one, at the beginning of that year, January of 2026, we would need to um, be prepared that Medicare primary care ahead would be implemented and that the Medicaid primary care alternative payment model would also go live. And again, um, the blueprint would serve as our alternative payment model. There would also need to be implementation, um, you know, that would start January of 2026 would begin the implementation of Medicare hospital global budgets. 90 days before the start of the second performance year, so in October of 2026, that's when those um, final all payer statewide total cost of care and primary care investment targets would need to be finalized and they would be included in an amended um, state agreement between states and, uh, and CMS. So that's another key milestone. So the process um, established during 2025, the targets themselves identified and memorialized in those amended agreements. And then also, by October of 2026, that's when we would um, need to have at least one commercial payer um, indicating that they will participate in a hospital global budget model. Um, and then um, by the end of that performance year, by December of 2026, that's when Medicaid hospital global budgets would need to be implemented. So a little, um, a little later time frame, um, potentially for Medicaid hospital global budgets could happen sooner as well. So that's performance year one. Performance year two, um, at the beginning, that's when um, measurement against those all payer total cost of care and primary care investment targets would begin. And again, you know, those are at the statewide level there would be that expectation that the Medicaid hospital global budgets would then go live and that we would have at least one commercial payer um, in a hospital global budget as well. And then um, we, you know, we've been talking, um, well, 
you know, CMS has been indicating that they will look toward a capitated track for their primary care ahead program. They're not prepared to do that in the first performance year 2026. They have said that they um, plan to offer a prospective payment capitated track, like some of our um, practices here in Vermont have been able to um, participate in under an all pay under our all payer model. So they will look to um, to develop that model. So you know they've said potentially for 2027. So that's something we'll really want to keep an eye on as well as a as an option for primary care if we get selected and if we um, decide to move forward. And then um, performance year three and beyond. Um, so there's another milestone in terms of the amount of um, Medicare fee for service uh, net patient revenue for hospitals is under the global budget. That um, that benchmark is 30 percent. So um, we would expect CMS to be verifying by October of 2028 that there is at least 30% of that net patient revenue in global budgets. So that's some, you know, that's a more detailed look at sort of milestones and, and uh, timeframes. It's, um, you know, again, we've gleaned a lot of that from um, the notice of funding opportunity from um, you know, webinars and conversations with CMS, their materials, um, but that's sort of the lay of the land over um, the next couple to few years in, in this model. Next slide. So, um, you know, in terms of that state level agreement that needs to be executed by July of 2025, um, as I mentioned, negotiations will really start by, um, you know, when when states are selected. And as we look at at the at the notice of funding opportunity and look at the requirements of the AHEAD model, we think that there are quite a few areas where there can be discussions and potentially negotiations with um, CMS. Uh, during that pre-implementation period in advance of the signing of the state level agreement. So we've bucketed them and, you know, this is sort of a dynamic list and I, I want to be clear about that, but, um, you know, we've um, identified several buckets where we think that there's some, um, you know, potential for negotiation, um, statewide accountability, hospital global budgets, primary care ahead, um, Medicare waivers, and then technical assistance. And so within those categories, we've identified the topics, um, you know, together, um, AHS and Green Mountain Care Board staff and our contractors, we've identified some areas um, some topics where we think there is some room for negotiation, and then um, estimated timing. So when you say when you see early, medium, later, early is in 2024. Um, we want to be um, really um, digging in on these topics. Medium, um, think early 2025 and later, not all that late, but um, later in 2025. So I'll just um, outline some of the um, topics that we think um, could benefit from further discussion. The first, um, not surprisingly, is the Medicare um, total cost of care targets. Uh, a, uh, and then secondly, that that's an earlier discussion. That's something we would want to really um, dig into pretty quickly. And then later, but not too much later, um, the all payer total cost of care targets. And, you know, again, that's something that CMS is really looking to the states to, um, you know, to, to um, identify and work on, but it's an area, a potential area of uh, negotiation and discussion. 
Um, similarly, the Medicare primary care investment targets, we see that as an earlier um, discussion. And then the all payer primary care investment targets, we um, think would be a later um, discussion topic. As you know, um, you know, in, an additional statewide accountability is the population health and equity targets. And we see that as something that we'd want to um, really make sure we're digging into early in 2025. So that's the statewide accountabilities. In terms of the hospital global budgets, again, um, you all have really been digging into um, the Vermont specific Medicare fee for service hospital global budget methodology. That work has been ongoing through our hospital global budget technical advisory group. Um, it's been ongoing um, as part of the board's discussions. And so clearly um, a very early, <laughs> Um, topic, especially since that methodology has to be submitted by um, July 1st. And then similarly, on a um, slightly less compressed time frame is the Medicaid Hospital Global Budget Methodology, CMS, has outlined principles um, for alignment, um, but um, we believe there's some room for discussion there. And then um, assuming, you know, that um, we move forward, you know, this is a very Vermont specific thing, but we do um, have the opportunity to um, have Medicare continue to support their portion of blueprint payments, and then also the support and services at home or SASH program, which is almost wholly funded by Medicare. And how those payments are treated and um, the mechanics of those payments um, is going to be important. And so we see that as an early discussion too, should we be selected for the model. Uh, primary care ahead, there's a number of areas there where we think that um, there's um, some important discussions to be had. I mentioned already that CMS has um, indicated an openness to primary care capitation. And so we would want to um, really, because we have really um, some, some relevant and good experience with capitated payment models for primary care, we'd want to um, be part of that discussion. We don't know when CMS will um, open that up and start um, talking about that, but we want to be there when that happens. Um, quality measures for primary care, they've outlined some proposed quality measures. They tend to be measures that we're familiar with, but, you know, we'll want to look and see if um, there's some choices to be made there um, from their list. And, you know, they've indicated that there's some potential to propose other measures if um, states desire. So we'll want to um, make sure that we engage in that. And then for measures that rely on clinical data, medical record data, um, they um, look like they'll be requiring them to use the electronic clinical quality measure reporting mechanism. Um, our understanding is that most of our states have certified electronic, I mean, most of our primary care practices have certified electronic health records and um, the capability to do that, but it's something we're going to really want to pay attention to in case um, practices that want to participate don't have that capability. So that seems like an early to medium discussion. Merit-based incentive payments reporting. Um, under our current all-payer model, primary care practices are exempt um, from having to um, report through that system and they um, get automatic payments for that, um, for, for those measures because our all-payer model is considered to be what's called an advanced alternative payment model. So by virtue of that, it exempts practices from that reporting. We are exploring um, some potential pathways um, to, to um, 
trying to maintain um, that exemption um, because what CMS has indicated is that until they move to a capitation type model, which would be more advanced, um, they don't see primary care ahead, which is really based on fee for service with an additional enhanced primary care payment as um, meeting those requirements for exemption. Um, but we think there may be, um, you know, we've had some conversations and we think there might be some other mechanisms. So that's very much an ongoing and early um, discussion. Uh, how the Medicare primary care payment model under a head would interface with the requirement for increased investment in primary care is something that's a bit unclear. Um, and so we feel like that's something that could use discussion clarification and is an early, um, early uh, discussion. And then how um, primary care payments are risk adjusted. That's another thing that we think is an early um, discussion. You know, all of these really, um, you know, getting answers to um, some of these elements as soon as possible um, is important in terms of primary care practices, understanding um, what the model means and um, what the value may, may be to them. So um, we consider all of these really um, early type discussions. Medicare waivers, um, this is where um, Medicare actually waives regulations um, to support goals of, um, of alternative payment models and to improve care delivery. We have some of those waivers in our current all-payer model. Um, there's an openness to um, extending some of those options um, if we extend the model into 2025. Um, and it can really, um, you know, there can be some creative um, care delivery um, that happens with these um, waiving of regulations. And so um, that's a conversation that's been ongoing and we'd wanna continue that um, in the fairly near term. And then um, technical assistance um, for the state and for providers. Um, one of the, I'll just give an example. One of the questions that, that's come up is, you know, there's some models that um, that providers can participate in at the same time as a head. So one example is the Medicare shared savings programs. Um, and so, you know, the question really is how do those interface and what does it mean if they participate in both? So we'd like to have some of those answers sooner rather than later as well. So I want to again emphasize this is a very much a dynamic um, document um, you know, obviously the strategy is, um, you know, executive session uh, type um, discussion, but, you know, these are some of the areas where we think there's some opportunity for discussion. Chair Foster, looks like your hand is up. I have one quick question. Um, with Maryland and Pennsylvania, did they qualify as advanced alternative payment models? Uh, I'm not sure about Pennsylvania. Um, I actually um, think that uh, Maryland has some tr different tracks in their um, primary care program. And we're, we're um, uh, actually planning to talk with them to learn more about that because we think that um, they might have some um, learnings that they could share with us about that. I'm not Thank as you. sure about Pennsylvania, um, but I do know that Maryland has at least um, some tracks that would qualify. Okay. All right, next slide. So um, at this point, I'd like to um, sort of dig into, um, and this is obviously a huge topic, but um, you know, how, are we, can we, um, you know, support the healthcare system? And I mean, really the broader health and human services system, because um, we're, all of the components um, 
of our care delivery um, in Vermont and play a role in um, the success or not of um, models like this. So, you know, really want to spend some time um, talking about what you know what what's what are people envisioning what are you know on the medicaid side medicare and also to the point that was made earlier by director barabay about um a key principle being multi-payer um approaches um how how are how are um different payers and providers thinking about um care transformation so you know this is really just going to scratch the surface um but uh, what i hope that um you'll take away from this is that um you know we're all um certainly providers certainly um people at ahs at the Green Mountain Care Board, um, we're all thinking about how we can support um, care transformation in a way that leads to um, a sustainable health care system and that most importantly improves um, health and outcomes for Vermonters. So, you know, huge topic. Um, I'll, I'll scratch the surface here, but I hope um, it's somewhat helpful to the discussion. Next slide. So, um, you know, in our in the healthcare reform arena, which we're all in, um, you know, it certainly isn't limited to um, AHS um, and my office. But you know, when we think about what um, we've been focused on in recent years, or really, you know, it can be boiled down to two. Um, big areas. One is the stability of our healthcare system. And that, you know, there were um, certainly challenges before the pandemic. Um, they seem to have been exacerbated by um, the pandemic and after the pandemic. So, you know, one key area is how can we um, in the short term and in the longer term, how can we stabilize our healthcare system? And I know you all think about that um, as you do your um, regulatory and other work as well. Second, um, you know, what it, what, what's our vision and direction? Um, you know, how can, we know that one reform isn't going to solve all of the healthcare problems, but how can we really have a, a strong focus on um, aligned and comprehensive reforms um, that really do address the challenges that we're facing and how can we prepare for a potential future multi-payer model like a head um, or other models so when you know when we think about the work we're doing it tends to fall into one of those two areas next slide so I've talked about this with you all um, before, so I won't, you know, belabor it, but we really, uh, um, in, in the Medicaid program here in Vermont, we really have um, had quite a focus on stability in um, recent years and on the broader system of care. So we've um, committed um, with, you know, the help of the legislature and the governor, um, over $164 million in base rate increases across the health system over the last two fiscal years and across the provider continuum. We have made um, targeted investments in areas where we see need um, in the past uh, three to four years. And some of those examples include um, the 988 Suicide Prevention Lifeline, Mental Health Mobile Crisis, and Youth Inpatient and Residential Mental Health Treatment as well. Um, the blueprint, we, and I'm going to actually use this as an example in a couple minutes, but we have, um, we have sought and um, received um, appropriations to uh, expand uh, mental health services, um, substance use disorder services, screening for health-related social needs in primary care practices that um, 
that participate in the blueprint. So um, really key area. Skilled nursing beds. Um, there have been, um, you know, there are people with complex needs who um, need a different type of and different level of um, skilled nursing facility. And so we're working on um, standing up a facility um, for folks with complex needs that should be in place uh, later this year. And then um, for another sector of the healthcare system, home health, um, we um, sought and received provider tax relief for home health agencies. So those are some of the examples. Workforce is another area that we've um, that we've uh, been involved in. And so there has been funding and a number of initiatives to really partner with healthcare <clears throat> and home and community-based service providers on um, recruiting, retaining, and growing the nursing workforce, other types of workers. And we also are in the process of setting up a healthcare workforce data center. And that should really provide some key information on what's happening. Um, it really pulls information that's out there together and um, additional information to let us know what's happening in the healthcare workforce. And then we, um, we were able to take advantage of an enhanced federal match for home and community-based services. And um, among other things, those uh, funds have been used to establish a grant program for HCBS providers to allow them to address um, infrastructure, workforce, care model innovation, and strengthening uh, provider processes. So, you know, that's just um, tip of the iceberg, but a number of um, efforts going on um, to improve stability in the broader system of care. Next slide. This is a um, slide we um, we tend to call it our portfolio slide and um, haven't um, shown this in a while, but it really lays out, um, you know, moving on from stability and, and looking at what's what's really the vision um, for a statewide approach um, for healthcare reform. Um, this captures sort of the different layers that we have used to try and um, support providers, um, provide incentives for improvement, um, and, and really try to meet some of those key goals um, for healthcare reform. So that the top layer um, really talks about what are the um, statewide um, accountabilities or statewide targets that we can, um, you know, really um, reinforce to help improve efficiency, to help improve quality, um, access. And so you'll see um, some of those um, elements. Total cost of care is one. Um, so, and that speaks to affordability and to um, efficiency. Um, quality speaks to better health and outcomes. What I haven't added here, but um, really should, is the primary care investment statewide accountability that um, is part of the AHEAD model and um, health equity. Um, so what are some of those key targets that we can agree on that really um, help us all um, drive toward the same results and outcomes. And then that intermediate level um, is, is a way of, you know, the, the broader targets are great because they sort of serve as a North Star, but then how can we start to tailor payments and other supports to providers um, to help reinforce um, achievement of those broader goals. So an example of that intermediate layer is what we call shared quality payments. And those are um, measures where two, how two or more providers work together can really make a difference in 
um, outcomes for patients. And so a couple of examples, one is um, follow up after hospitalization for mental illness. Clearly that includes both the hospital and outpatient service providers. Readmissions are another one that's an example of, you know, where if you can um, reinforce and actually provide payment for successful results on those measures, it really encourages um, providers to work together. And we've done, you know, we've, we've got a lot of those measures in some of our current programs. And then that um, more direct layer um, at the bottom of the graphic really talks about, um, you know, specific provider supports, um, using payments that encourage, um, you know, optimal care, high quality care. These could be multi-payer payments. They can be payer specific. A lot of the work we've done is Medicaid specific, but there's also some really notable multi-payer um, work as well. So examples there for the different provider types, blueprints, um, patient-centered medical home payments and community he health team payments, those are multi-payer in Vermont. Um, enhanced um, and population-based payments, the AHEAD model talks about an enhanced primary care payment. Our current model uses um, population-based payments. That's another example. Health system global budgets, which um, the AHEAD model is looking toward, that's an example as well. Um, case rates, we have Medicaid case rates for um, mental health, um, adult and children's mental health rate right now. So that's another example. And then episodic payments as well. So an example there is that we've implemented episodic payments for residential substance use disorder treatment. So some, you know, some of those even more direct payments and supports that provide flexibility um, can help us achieve those broader goals. So that's, you know, I, I it's a bit of a busy graphic, but it really does sort of lay out that it it takes all of those things the statewide accountabilities and, um, and focus, um, that which really gets us driving in the same direction, um, the shared quality payments when there's multiple providers that work together to um, support a person's needs, and then those more um, provider-specific payments that um, can help us um, support delivery of services. So. Next slide, please. I'm going to pick it up a little here because I, I know we're um, getting short on time, but I did want to, you know, just use the blueprint as one example. You know, we started out with that program with um, patient-centered medical homes and community health teams, but as other needs became apparent, um, you know, opioid use disorder. Um, and you know, working with the health department to stand up the hub and spoke um, program through the Blueprint Community Health Teams, the Pregnancy Intention Initiative, um, which um, yeah, you know, provides care for people of childbearing age, and also really um, digs into um, social determinants of health and psycho psychosocial screening. Um, that's another. Um, more specialized program that was set up um, through the blueprint. And then the SASH program actually started when Medicare started funding the blueprint program. And that was focused on um, serving, you know, providing wellness nurses and care coordinators to work with um, elderly and disabled Medicare beneficiaries. So those are examples of how a program um, can evolve as needs of the population evolves. Next slide. And then most recently, um, you know, we are in the second year now, or about to be in the second year, I guess, um, of uh, the two-year pilot for um, the Blueprint for Health to improve um, access to mental health, substance use disorder services, and address social determinants of health in um, 
primary care. So integrating services with primary care. And that's just one example. All those other programs, the um, skilled nursing facility beds for people with complex needs, uh, uh, several mental health um, initiatives, all of those, um, you know, are really intended to identify and address needs and to prepare the system um, and support the system in care delivery transformation. Next slide. So federally, and I'm going to actually move through these quite quickly because you've seen um, some of these slides before, but um, you know, while Medicare models don't always have specific investments for the broader system of care, because, you know, they, they don't always fund those services, what we do see in the um, federal models is that they encourage um, organizations to partner together um, to meet broader needs for folks. Um, they highlight um, the potential that if there are um, savings and efficiencies to shift funding to preventive and community-based care. A lot of that flexibility that you see in, um, in their models um, does support um, that, sh that shifting of resources. Uh, the Medicare waivers I talked about already. And then um, CMS is very focused on advancing multi-payer approaches, as you all had mentioned earlier, as being important. Next slide. So in the AHEAD model, you know, they specifically speak to um, transforming care. Um, as it says here, they aim to support um, hospitals in transforming care delivery and shifting utilization to primary care and community-based settings where appropriate. And then in primary care ahead, they want to see alignment um, with state Medicaid primary care goals, but they very much are um, focused on having Medicare join that effort um, through increased investment and through supporting care transformation initiatives. Next slide. Um, so in terms of hospital global budgets, this slide really outlines where they see um, that global budgets could support um, cost control, quality, and also um, care delivery transformation. So um, steady, predictable financing, flexibility in how to provide services, um, supports for improving equity and quality of care and the health of the whole population, um, ability um, under global budgets for hospitals to share in savings um, when avoidable um, services, uh, use of services can be reduced. Um, and then they are um, providing funding, and um, this could be, you know, a point of negotiation, but they are um, uh, adding funding in the early years of hospital global budgets um, to support transformation, um, controlling growth in hospital spending, and then opportunities to learn from other, hospital, uh, other hospitals that have joined the model. Um, the fact that... Um, states can help design that hospital global budget methodology for Medicare and also for Medicaid and commercial. It really does, you know, potentially offer an opportunity to address some of our transformation goals. Next slide. Um, you've seen this before, but this is, you know, when C this is their slide, this is CMS's slide, the boxes are ours, but the circles are theirs. And, you know, they've talked about what they want to see when they provide enhanced payments to primary care. They want to see integration of mental health and substance use disorder treatment in primary care. They want to see um, efforts to identify and address health-related social needs, and then improving coordination of care and, um, you know, particularly specialty care. And these are just, the boxes are just some examples. Um, but this, again, is what we've been working on here in Vermont together with our um, you know, community providers, um, this is what we've been working on with the blueprint. So it feels um, very supportive of the efforts that we've been engaging in here. 
Next slide. Um, this, out, and you've seen this before too, so I won't um, dwell on it, but it outlines um, some of the waiver flexibilities that we think if we um, are um, move forward with a 2025 extension of the current model, um, CMS has indicated that they will add um, these waiver flexibilities. And again, that can really help um, support care delivery and care transformation. Next slide. Um, health equity, very key to the AHEAD model. And in particular, um, states that are selected will be expected to develop a statewide health equity plan. Um, hospitals that participate in global budgets will um, be required to have health um, hospital equity plans, um, support for um, increasing, enhancing data collection on demographics so that we can actually monitor um, disparities of health and what the impacts are of um, initiatives. And then again, um, similar to what was mentioned in the primary care um, transformation, screening and referrals for health-related social needs. All of these are intended to be part of the model and are supportive of um, care transformation. Next slide. And then um, also in AHEAD, um, there's a quality strategy as well. And um, it's at really three different levels, statewide, um, what are the statewide quality accountabilities with a health equity focus, um, primary care, and then hospital um, quality programs as well, um, many of which are already in place, but um, really looking to um, assess um, how care delivery is going and how transformation is, um, is, is being implemented. And then I think my last slide is, um, you know, just a summary, and you've um, heard me say this before, but how the AHEAD model really um, fits in in the context of broader healthcare reform. If we were to move forward with it, it would be one component. Um, it could, you know, potentially address some of our challenges. It ensures that we have that multi-payer approach where Medicare um, can join Medicaid and commercial insurers and in paying for health care differently. It does have an emphasis on primary care and hospital payments and um, a, a requirement for care transformation activities, health equity central to the model. In Vermont, it would continue support for the blueprint and SASH. Um, the waivers, we've talked about how they could provide flexibility. And then um, finally, those statewide accountabilities related to total cost of care, primary care, equity, and population health outcomes. And that's it. Thank you again um, for having the chance to come and talk to you about where we're at. Thank you very much, Ms. Jones. Um, why don't we do board member questions and then we'll turn to the provider panel um, if there are any board comments or questions for Ms. Jones or Ms. Barabee. I had one brief one on slide 17 and the $164 million in base rate increases. I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit more specifically in terms of the kinds of investments and um, what they were used for. I think that might be helpful. Yeah, um, they tend to be um, rate increases for um, various uh, provider types. And I can, um, you know, I can uh, get more detail for you and um, bring it back, but, um, it could include everything from, um, you know, we made some rate increases in some of the choices for care programs, for example, um, adult day services. Um, there were, incre you know, we brought um, 
primary care payments up to, I believe it's 110% of Medicare rates. So, you know, we're always looking at what our rates are for the various provider types. And, um, you know, we um, do rate studies um, at times and really assess um, how those rates are really um, keeping up, honestly. And I'm happy to provide, I can provide you actually with a listing of that that would give you more specifics. Yeah, that'd be helpful. I'd love to see that. So okay. thank you. Sure. Um, I have nothing else. Okay. I, I guess the, the one thing that I would ask, um, Pat, and thanks so much again for coming, is I think I'd love to learn more at some point about the, the Medicaid global budget methodology for us to think about the, the Medicare and commercial components and how they interact. Um, if that's something at some point we could get an update on. And also, I think all the hard work that the state and AHS has done to try to alleviate the post-acute care um, bottlenecks I, I, you know, that, that hospitals have been experiencing with trying to discharge patients and, and support for long-term care. So those are two things that I, I'd love to hear more about the hard work you're doing. Great, thank you. Um, I will um, share that. and. In terms of the Medicaid um, global budget methodology, I'll just say we're not, well, in some ways we are farther along because of, you know, the experience with the current model. And there's some elements of that that could lend themselves to design of a um, Medicaid global budget methodology. But I'll also say because of the um, different timing, we're not as far along on that as, um, as the Medicare um, methodology, but um, I know that we would be um, glad to um, share where we're at on that and what our plans are with that. So thanks for asking. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Jones. Thank you. Um, I'll turn to our next discussion, which is a provider perspective on Vermont School of Budget Design. We have a number of providers and um, industry groups that are here to speak to us. I will quickly go through the list so people have a general sense of who everyone is. And um, if it works for the panel, I'll have you go in the order that you're on the agenda. Um, if that doesn't work for you, that's fine, but it might be the most organized way unless you've agreed to do something different. Um, but I'll go through it quickly. We have Alicia Jacobs from the Vermont Academy of Family Physicians, Rick Dooley from Health First, Susan Ridson from Health First, Jessa Barnard from the Vermont Medical Society, Andrew Garland from Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont, Mary Kate Molman from Bi-State, uh, Judy Fox uh, from Rutland Regional Medical Center, uh, John Aislin from Primary Care Health Partners, Joe Wooden from Copley, Rick Vincent from UVM, um, Devin Green from the Vermont Associ Association of Hospitals and Health Systems, Trey Dobson uh, from Southwestern Vermont Medical Center, and Mike Fisher from the Healthcare Advocate. Um, so I'll turn it over to uh, Alicia Jacobs, if you're ready. Ah, now, can you hear me? Okay, <laughs> sorry, I was going the wrong place. Thank you very much. Um, good, good afternoon, everyone. I am Alicia Jacobs. I am a family medicine physician. I have been in Vermont since 96. I came here for residency, worked at uh, the Community Health Center for a couple of years and have been uh, hospital employed at um, the Colchester practice of the UVM Health Network for over 20 years now. Um, I am coming, though, I also for the past five years have been on the board of the um, Vermont chapter of the American Academy of Family Physicians. I function as a delegate for the state of Vermont um, at the national level, and I also sit on a commission of the AAFP on quality and practice. 
and we discussed things like payment reform. And um, so I advocated at a national level on these issues. But so you know, I have other roles too. So in full disclosure, I was uh, um, the vice chair of uh, clinical operations in the Department of Family Medicine for 12 years. So I have a lot of operational experience. I have moved from that into a well-being informaticist role. I really believe in supporting the healthcare workforce through all means possible. And um, now I'm trying to do so through digital health. Um, and lastly, I do have a role at OneCare as well. I work particularly in um, the comprehensive payment reform, um, some work around the stiff, SNF, the skilled nursing facilities that we're problem, trying to problem solve statewide. Um, I also am the uh, chair of the Health Equity and Access Work Group, and um, and I've been uh, participating in our statewide our initiative, statewide initiative to get standardized in how we screen and respond to the health needs um, assessments that we do. So uh, I would tell you um, all of these probably contribute to my opinions, um, but I'm really coming as an advocate from the um, Academy, the chapter. Um, you all, I think you're the choir. I don't think I need to convince you that primary care is high value, but I want to say it out loud. Um, I um, I don't want to be um, too vitriolic, but I kind of believe that family medicine could save the world if anybody, if everybody just had a, a family medicine doc to take care of them, and. Um, and uh, allow them to at least have enough health to live, you know, a good life. So, um, so I'm coming from that perspective, and I also can tell you, I've, you know, I've managed uh, the family medicine workforce, and I'm connected to lots of people in different ways throughout the state. And level of burnout in family medicine, in primary care, I should say, uh, is really exponentially high. Um, reaching up into the 80% sometimes. So I'm concerned about our workforce. Um, I will tell you, I feel a little less concerned after hearing that presentation. I do want to say thank you because it was really helpful. And I appreciate that we have, I do, I do hear and I appreciate that we have like the right goals in mind. And yet I still have some concerns. Um, I would, um, and I also, I do want to do a shout out for the efforts the state has been doing in reducing administrative burden because um, there are things like that will really change our lives. You know, um, the prior auth and the um, telehealth parity, that is really important to us. Um, what I'm particularly worried about is this fragile workforce and this major disruptive change that's coming. Um, so, I, I would like to, um, if I can, for just one minute, um, talk about what I love about the all payer model. Um, and I, you shouted out some of them. I love the waivers. I love the all state, like we are all part of this and it is novel. When I go and present nationally on some of the work we're doing, people are watching us. This is, and they are saying, when are you, like they are watching Vermont. And so it's really important that we do this work together. Um, I love that we collaborate across um, organizations. I love it that I'm in the room with independent practitioners working on quality work. Um, I love that we have capital payments and stability. And I also love, like really love, sorry, I'm being a lot, um, our um, comprehensive payment reform, which has been a really novel way to grow the investment in primary care. Any other states that have been doing that are doing it through legislation or executive order. We're doing it through the ACO, and I think it's been in like a fantastic model that has stabilized a lot of independent um, practices. Um, particularly, work was wonderful during the pandemic, but has we've also been able to grow it over time, and we still have a five-year plan for how to develop that further. So that's a list of the things I love about what things are like now. Here are my concerns about AHEAD. I, I actually am worried that it's actually going to be an overall decrease in primary care investment. I understand that the PMPM PM will be going up, 
but I really I'm concerned that if it's not all payers, that it's going to just be a small segment of our patient populations and hence the actual investment will go down overall. I'm also concerned about the cognitive overload of having different systems for different payers, and that's not what we have now. So that feels like a lot to me, and I'm worried about that. Um, I'm worried that it's Medicare only and Medicare Advantage gets exempted. I don't like that. I'll just say that out loud. Um, and that's along those lines of I want to treat all my patients all the same. That's how we're going to get health equity, right? And so I don't want to have different systems for different populations. Um, I am worried that it's going to be a big loss for primary care. We have made great gains in um, transformation towards value-based care. Um, I can speak as um, an employee of the UVM Health Network. We have a massive high-value care um, um, transformation going on right now. I'm not really worried that that's going to come apart, but I um, I do worry that our comprehensive payment reform may will come apart, and I'm very concerned about my colleagues that are in independent practices. Um, I um, don't want um, increased reporting. I'm very concerned about the MIP, so I appreciate you trying to negotiate that um, and a, an exemption to that. And I'm also concerned that certain hospitals can opt out. Again, there is something really powerful about the our um, all payer model where everyone participates. And um, I would be in favor of trying to negotiate something where that continues. Um, um, and then there's the whole uh, change control and who would manage this and and how are we going to support our fragile workforce during this massive change? And that is like a, just a large question. Also. So just in summary, I'm not I'm not worried about me. I'm going to be fine, but I am worried about our group of family, our group of primary care physicians. Um, I watch time after time. I watch them like decrease their FTE, do less and less because it's harder and harder to do this work. And I'm worried that um, we're contracting our workforce and we're not supporting them enough. Um, and and that's and that hence I'm worried about like the health of all our Vermonters. So if I have a quick like list of recommendations, I love that you're exploring all options. That I I kind of understand this is really our only option, <laughs> but maybe there are other options. I just exploring all options and all strategies to make this work for us. I appreciate that, I want to say. Um, I really would implore us to look for an exemption to the MIPS requirement to continue those waivers um, and uh, somehow work on all hospital and all payer participation. And then um, um, just don't drop our primary care workforce. And uh, I don't know what that means for both the transition and when we start, but really making sure that we're using novel ways to in increase our investment in primary care. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, um, Alicia. Uh, Rick Dooley. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate Alicia's comments. I think she actually read right off my notes because I think I have every single point that she had. So I like to suggest say ditto, but I'm going to highlight a few things. I'll I'll do it quickly though. Uh, so my name is Rick Dooley. I work for Thomas Chitton Health Center. I'm a family practice PA there and have been for the last 24 years or so. I'm also the clinical network director for Health First, representing independent practices um, across the state. Um, I also came here in 1996 as well and been doing primary care ever since. Um, so I think yeah, we've all heard a lot about the AHEAD model, um, and uh, Pat, I really appreciate your um, overview today. A lot of my concerns, you did address some of them today as well. So um, I think the strengths that I hear from most of my independent colleagues about the AHEAD model is certainly anything that increases funding to primary care 
is fantastic. Anything that gives us more money to provide that care is great. We're underfunded as it is. Um, I think the fact that this would allow us to continue with Blueprint and SASH funding, um, retain some of those waivers, especially like the, the three-day skilled nursing facility waiver, fantastic. Um, the alignment of the behavioral health integration, the health-related social needs screening, and the care coordination goals in the, trans in the transformation model, um, that's great. It's work we're already doing, so we appreciate that. Um, that being said, there are definitely some significant concerns. Um, the provider community has provided feedback straight through this whole process, both in the AHS uh, primary care work group and the Green Mountain Care Board primary care advisory group. So I know these are not things that are going to be new to most people on this call because um, the same concerns have consistently risen to the top of the list. Um, there's a crippling lack of access to primary care. Um, we need more support for primary care to reduce administrative burden and an increased ability to recruit and retain providers. And we also need more flexibility in how care is delivered so that we can support and reimburse use of other providers since we clearly don't have enough um, MPs, PAs, and physicians to do the work. Um, it's not clear to many in the provider community how the head model actually addresses um, those access concerns or how it will encourage people to come into primary care. Um, we share the same um, concerns that, that Alicia mentioned about the small number of patients this affects. Um, it used to be pre-pandemic, every talk I went to on healthcare reform said that we needed to have a critical mass of 60 to 65 percent of folks um, uh, in a payment model before you can actually change the way care is delivered. Um, Post-pandemic, no one talks about that 60 to 65 percent, and I think that's because we realize that we can't get there, so um, people just stop talking about it. You know, this is a Medicare model, so maybe 15% of patients. I agree, not having Medicare Advantage patients is huge, especially when Medicare Advantage patients, that's an increasing demographic in the state. So the number of straight Medicare folks is going to go down over time. Um, saying Medicaid has to align, um, it's not clear, is that just for quality measures or is there enhanced payments with Medicare that'll be comparable to the Medicare, uh, with Medicaid that'll be comparable to the Medicare patients? Even when you combine Medicaid and Medicare, you're still at you know, maybe 30% of patients for our practice. So if we don't get the commercials, Blue Cross, and MVP in the room, um, it's impossible to make any sort of real transformation. Um, and of course, for Vermont, you can't talk about, about uh, payment reform without acknowledging that there's a huge self-insured population that um, you know, sort of the self-insurers play by their own rules. And so you can't loop them in anyhow. And I feel like that really needs to be addressed. We've said it for years, but there's got to be a way to address that or, or this is not um, going to be successful. Um, uh, finally, pediatrics. You know, this is a Medicare-based model. Um, and what happens with the PEDS folks who have very, very low Medicare numbers? Um, in terms of the CPR program, I'll, I'll echo Alicia also that the CPR program has been fantastic for, certainly for my practice in Williston, for a number of our independent practices. Um, it's a mixed bag. Some folks do not have the same uh, uh, positive outcomes with uh, financially with the CPR practice as others. Um, but we spent five years building on the system of capitated care, including adding positions around things like care coordination, stuff that's not reimbursed, but we could afford it through the capitated model. Um, now, all of a sudden, this is going to look very different if we go back to a fee-for-service model, at least until 2027, before they start maybe uh, adding capitation back again. Um, and again, the enhanced payments are only for those Medicare folks, so we lose the enhanced payments for the other folks in the system, and we only gain them for Medicare. Um, there are a number of practices that feel that this would actually be a net loss to them in revenue at a time when we're trying to stabilize primary care. Um, Again, the complexity of the model is tremendous. I think, um, Pat, every time I look at one of the presentations and we go through the slides, uh, I, again, appreciate how many moving parts there are here. Um, I feel like nobody really understands it. And when we talk to providers and groups um, and even folks from the room about what is ahead, um, people, it's hard to even figure out what the questions are to ask to understand what's going on. Um, while we all understand that the healthcare reform landscape is incredibly complex, there's no easy answers. Um, if providers can't understand the model, they they can't understand how it's going to affect their ability to remain remain viable. Um, I will say that as evidence today, with the release of the um, anticipated insurance rate increases, um, we need to bring down the total cost of care. We need to bring down uh, insurance premiums. And if independent and non-hospital players in the healthcare system start closing, it will have a direct negative impact on that cost of care. 
Um, uh, you've heard me say it before, I'll say it again, independent physicians and advanced practice practitioners like uh, NPs and PAs provide high quality care at lower cost than other players in the system. The Ambulatory Surgery Center has consistently provided excellent outcomes and tremendous patient satisfaction at a lower cost than the hospital. Um, our lone non-hospital MRI in uh, here in South Burlington allows for high quality scans at about 25 to 50 percent the cost of a hospital based scan and access measured in days to weeks instead of weeks to months. Vermont's healthcare system can't afford to lose any of these providers. If the AHEAD model destabilizes these independent providers and causes them to go under, the total cost of care will go up, not down, and that is incredibly concerning. And finally, I'll just say the provider concern um, is predominantly about the many unknowns in moving forward with the system. And I appreciate, Pat, how much there is sort of stuff that we that we just can't know yet or that CMS hasn't told us or that's still in negotiation. Um, but, you know, five years ago when we had these discussions, you know, before one care, when it was going to be Vermont cares and it was going to be all payer, um, truly all payer across all all entities, um, you know, discussion was focused on defragmenting our healthcare system, aligning quality measures based on community needs and simplified but appropriate reimbursements to support a primary care based healthcare system. And that was the dream back then. And we all were excited sitting in the room about it um, with this uh, sort of a head model. It seems like we're taking a step back to a more fragmented, more complex system. Um, and it just doesn't seem like it's gonna push Vermont in the direction that we that we need to be going. Um, so I, I agree with Alicia, I don't know if there are other options available that are more, more broad, um, but I think you know, Vermont can be a true leader. I'm, I'm not convinced, and I think a lot of the providers I talk to are not convinced that this is the right avenue to lead. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Dooley. Um, Susan Ritson. Hi, thank Hi. you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I also just want to say thanks to everyone at AHS, Pat and Wendy and the other folks and all the Green Mountain Care Board members and staff and the healthcare advocate, hospital uh, representatives, and basically everyone who has put so much time into uh, understanding the AHEAD model, um, just being able to listen to the discussions has been extremely helpful. So thank you for that. Um, you know, Rick and Dr. Uh, Jacobs did touch upon um, some of those strengths and weaknesses from the primary care perspective. Um, I'll add that another strength that I think the AHEAD model does offer is the ability to continue to collaborate with CMMI and to a certain extent CMS by extension. I do think um, there's value in that and keeping us in kind of the value based um, program space because, uh, you know, I don't see that going away anytime soon as far as CMS is concerned. Um, I also like the equity focus of the head model. Um, and of course, you know, the enhanced payments to primary care and um, blueprint SASH funding and, um, you know, the Medicare waiver access. That being said, uh, we do have significant concerns, and I should have mentioned that I'm the executive director of Health First, and we represent uh, 62, soon to be 61, unfortunately, um, primary care and specialty um, care practices located across Vermont. Um, so some of the concerns we have about HEAD and the HEAD process, um, although um, Pat did speak to some of them today, and I appreciated that, Pat, thank you. Um, but uh, we haven't to date has seen a detailed analysis of the head versus the other alternative options. I think that's really important for us to have in order to evaluate whether we should move forward with the head. Um, I also don't see a clear glide path for practices to harmlessly transition them away from the all payer model. Of course, that exists whether or not we have a head, um, but I think that's something that our state really needs to focus uh, some attention on uh, soon. Because uh, I'm very worried about this transition destabilizing our already fragile primary care practices. I also foundationally do not see this model addressing affordability. Um, you know, for all practical purposes, we've been doing global budgets for some time now. Um, we've been doing total cost of care, yet we all saw this week that uh, we're looking at more increases in premiums, um, nine to nineteen percent. Um, I just don't see a head um, changing that dynamic. Um, 
We need to use levers that will control the high hospital prices that are largely responsible for these rate increases, such as um, uh, reference based pricing. We also need to work to expand Vermont's network of lower cost sites of care. Um, I don't know if folks are aware, but Vermont has one multi specialty ambulatory center surgery center. It's that's um, the fewest of any state in the nation. As Rick mentioned, we have one lone um, independent imaging center. Um, we just Vermonters do not have choices to get lower cost um, care. Um, we're very hospital centric and we're paying high hospital prices for care that does not need to be delivered in a hospital. Don't get me wrong. I, I we we support hospitals. We believe we need a strong hospitals. Um, we just don't believe that hospitals need to be providing all the care that they do. Um, let them focus on what they're good at and let's let the community providers provide the other care um, at, a, at a lesser cost. We also don't believe that the model will improve access to care that we all know is an issue here. Um, you know, the model really seems to drive focus on decreasing utilization, which really isn't an issue here in Vermont. Um, and, you know, Pat did have a slide that talks about, um, you know, the head model is supportive of shifting care to primary care and it, it may do that in some regards with the enhanced primary care payments. But also starting in year four, the model, um, those enhanced payments are included in the total cost of care measure. And if we're trying to drive that down, um, that you know could theoretically um, incentivize less uh, investment in the primary care system. And really, this this model just is not a system wide model. You have the hospital part, and you have the primary part, and we really need to shore up other parts of the system so that the hospitals, um, you know, have the support they need to get um, people who need mental health support and home health out of um, the ED and into the community where they can get care. Um, this model, I don't see doing that. Um, this model is astonishingly complex um, and expensive to operationalize. I think of just the what it's costing for all of us to be here today and just the countless hours that we have all put in to try to understand this model. Um, let alone operationalize it. Um, I, I just feel so complex. It doesn't decrease administrative burden. It adds another layer of complexity. And it's this type of complexity um, that is, you know, driving providers out of uh, healthcare, um, or it's driving in them into the direct care model where they don't even accept insurance or, or participate in these models because it's just too much. They just want to take care of their patients. Um, the other thing that it's helping to uh, drive is just um, the private equity um, backed like management services organizations to help um, independent practices in particular, like deal with all these complexities is just too much. Um, so this model, you know, just contributes to that and distracts us from what really needs to be done. Um, I don't see this model um, really uh, helping to um, make clear the ongoing ambiguities who's really in charge of improving Vermont's healthcare system. Um, you know, I'm just going to say it out loud. We seem to have this fight between AHS and the Green Mountain Care Board, and I, d I don't see this helping that matter. Um, we don't really know who's in charge. Um, I also am concerned that the proposed ahead model governance um, seems to specifically include only one clinician. Um, there is mention of provider organizations being included, but um, not necessarily clinicians other than the one that was specifically mentioned unless I missed it somewhere. Um, Rick talked about a number of the primary care issues. Um, and. So basically, in summary, I mean, we feel that this model is exceedingly complex and provides no clear evidence that it's going to address Vermont's most pressing problems of affordability and access to care. Uh, we believe that we should focus our attention on those things that we know need to be fixed, um, building a guide plat path for um, primary care to move away from the all-payer model, helping to um, doing more to recruit and retain primary care clinicians, 
um, strengthening the community-based services and um, increasing access and utilization to lower cost sites of care, doing things like reforming the certificate of need laws that have basically resulted in Vermont having, you know, almost no uh, independent facilities um, and most, most care being delivered in the hospital. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Ms. Ridzen. Um, Ms. Barnard, how are you? Hi, good, thank you. Thanks for having all of us this yeah, afternoon. Good. Really appreciate the um, panel or the, the board um, hearing from this whole panel. I'm Jessa Barnard. I'm the executive director of the Vermont Medical Society. So we are a physician membership organization. We represent physicians of all specialties and um, practice settings. But I'm also um, speaking to some comments that I just submitted yesterday and I think are now up on your board um, off to your board website under the public comment um, location on behalf of the um, Vermont Academy of Family Physicians and American Academy of Pediatrics as well. We work very closely with a number of um, specialty societies, but especially our partners in um, primary care at AAP and BTAFP. So these are on behalf of all of our organizations. Um, and I will really try my best not to repeat. I so appreciate um, the folks who went before me because I think we have you'll hear a lot of common themes. So I'll try to pull out a couple of um, points maybe that they um, didn't hit quite as much or some things I really want to emphasize. Um, one thing I, I really want to highlight, we appreciate so much the work that AHS has done so far to hear from providers and provider organizations. Um, they really have done a lot of outreach. Uh, we have, we've participated in the primary care work group, which has had some very robust um, discussions. We know there are clinicians on the global budget technical advisory group. Um, and the um, overall health reform group. So we just really want to advocate for keeping strong um, clinician and 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 uh, healthcare organization input into um, whatever model is moving forward. We think that's really key to anything um, working on the ground in our state. Um, and uh, to echo what Susan just said, making sure there is robust provider representation on the head model governance body. That's also something that jumped out at us as um, sort of uh, sort of peripheral to that group where we think that should really be central to um, the head model governance body. I wanna emphasize one thing. So I'll start with some primary care payments, this $17 um, per beneficiary per month payment that we've talked about. Um, because one thing I wanna point out is that that $17 is an average um, where CMMI is actually saying it will be a range from 15 to $21 perhaps. And um, that concerns us um, because part of the upward or downward uh, adjustments to that payment is based on the st on statewide performance, such as hospital participation goals and state uh, Medicare fee-for-service growth targets, factors over which we're concerned primary care has um, little to absolutely no influence. Um, so one thing we would like to ask for in negotiations with CMMI is a more predictable um, primary care payment and also one that uh, is actually under the influence of primary care practices. Um, I will echo what you heard about the linking that 17 only to fee-for-service Medicare as opposed to, um, so that could really um, impact uh, pediatrics. Um, especially as well as um, practices that see more Medicare Advantage um, patients. So another um, request on that side is to ask for what um, AHS can potentially do on the Medicaid side. Uh, I think you heard this um, from Rick or other um, ways we can make sure that practices of all types, all primary care practices um, can benefit from um, payments to participate in this model. Um, I also want to mention, and this I know this is uh, somewhat out of our state's control, but I just think it has to be called out because it, it impacts a lot of the provider organizations, is that while CMMI is dedicating additional resources to primary care through this model, on the other hand, CMS Medicare's fee-for-service fee schedule continues to decrease year over year. Um, so this is their prof this is Medicare's professional fee service um, um, fee schedule. So we're concerned, you know, yes, it's great they're they're dedicating some more resources on here, but if the underlying fee for service fee schedule keeps being reduced, and in, in fact, in Vermont, it hits primary care doubly hard because Medicaid mirrors 
that fee schedule. So when that fee schedule is reduced, both our Medicare and Medicaid payments go down. Um, and so that's something we think AHS and in negotiations, perhaps with CMMI, I don't know if there's a way to in involve this or just really encourage CMS and CMMI to be talking to each other about how can we make sure that all parts of our organization are supporting primary care um, in a coherent way, as opposed to um, one model working in one direction while the other side is actually undermining some of those um, goals. I think the one other um, piece that has not, uh, sorry, it actually has been mentioned quite a bit, but I just want to pull out the piece about the disruptive change for primary care that this will lead to. Um, we know there's going to be change. We know we can't have the all-payer model um, forever, um, but we think there needs to be adequate resources and support for primary care going through these changes, and it's not really clear to us where that will live. Um, we have been um, lucky to have um, an ACO available that, you know, can take a phone call at any time and talk a practice through if they want to participate in their programs, if they want to participate in the CPR program, how does that compare to their current um, budget? You know, what, what, what will the, how will this influence um, cash flow? What are the quality measures? Um, what are the pros and cons of joining? Um, the state application indicates some support by Blueprint for Health staff and quality improvement facilitators. Um, our experience is those individuals are much more focused on clinical transformation as opposed to financial modeling um, and really looking at a detailed fiscal impact analysis and support and a transition to a new model. So we would really request um, a plan for what entity would take the lead in those kinds of tasks, how that might need to be funded and supported. Um, let me just, I want to make sure I hit my, oh, we, um, so we've heard about the CPR program quite a bit. Um, we absolutely support the continuation of a capitated model for primary care. Uh, we understand the CMMI may or may not be able to start that right away. Um, but again, we'd ask, is this a place where AHS and Medicaid could develop a capitated primary care program earlier um, to help fill some of that gap and um, bridge that transition? Um, and we know that we've also heard um, or saw in the application looking at the blueprint um, additional blueprint PMPM payments to patient-centered medical homes to help complement additional payments to primary care or to increase investment in primary care. And we would support looking at that as a potential um, avenue. Um, and one other, um, I also just want to mention um, data um, with, with this model and practices. Um, you know, a lot of this model, uh, a concern takes a lot of the um, kind of filtering and interpreting of data, quality data, data fiscal data, perhaps potentially from a state entity that providers participate in, um, the ACO, and puts that control in CMS's hands or CMMI's hands in terms of their attribution numbers, their quality numbers. Um, so we are concerned about making sure practices have that data available to them. They can obtain and review for accuracy any um, Medicare patient data for attribution, quality, or performance measures. Um, and I want to echo, um, I think, what a few folks have said about reducing administrative burden. Another concern is losing the ACO um, waivers, the ACO prior authorization waivers. Um, and so what can the state do? Um, you know, we, we've we been working hard with a number of partners on this call around um, H-766, around prior authorization on the commercial side, but are there ways that Medicaid and Medicare Advantage plans can also be looking at their prior authorization and um, uh, administrative requirements. Um, can that be built in or negotiated with CMMI? Um, I will. So those are some pieces on the the primary care payments. I want to mention the primary care spend target. Um, we support having a primary care spend target and working towards an increased um, investment in primary care. We've been part of the work that DIVA and Green Mountain Care Board has been doing in this area for a number of years. Um, however, we do think there are a lot of details still to work out, and we haven't um, gotten to sort of the granular understanding of what this might look like in Vermont. Um, we, again, think that since the model governance body looks to have some role in informing primary care spend targets, that's another reason to need robust primary care participation in that group, and also some more um, clarity and detail between um, how this relates to our current regulatory structure. Um, sort of who's the lead on coming up with this target? How does it relate to um, existing negotiations with payers over contract terms and, and 
reaching those targets? How is it incorporated into the Green Mountain Care Board's current insurance and hospital rate regulation systems um, and the role of the modern model governance body versus other entities in setting that target? Um, so we would look forward to both participating in and, and knowing more about um, sort of the details on the primary care spend piece. We also support um, the importance of needing to build in hospital sustainability if we're moving towards a global budget, that that needs to be a sufficient global budget to create predictability and sustainability for hospitals and hospital workforce. Again, we're sort of, we're kind of a, we're a provider based organization and um, we are, you know, we've heard over and over about workforce pressures. We've had the wait time study and we know that it's not just primary care that had there's lack of access, but also to do certain specialty services. And um, if Vermont is not able to negotiate a sustainable global budget that captures savings and supports the ability to hire and retain both primary care and specialty clinicians, we're concerned it would hamstring efforts to have the workforce our state needs to prevent higher cost admissions, address these wait time issues and more. Um, so again, we we appreciate all the work that's gone into this model and refer you to even lengthier written comments for more details on some of our recommendations. So thank you for hearing from us today. Thank you. We received your um, written help a comment. Um, I think it was last night. Thank you very much for that. It's very thoughtful and helpful. So thanks for putting in the time to do that. Um, Ms. Fox. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So yeah, I, hi, how are you? Um, thank you for inviting me today. Um, and I agree with the presenters before me. Certainly uh, some common themes um, in, in what we'll hear and what you'll hear around the complexity of this reform work, uh, highlighting our the critical importance in partnerships within our community, our community partners, but also with uh, our, our folks, uh, you folks at the state level and, and federal partners. I'm not going to reiterate some of the comments that have been made. I'm going to focus on access um, and uh, avoidable utilization um, and data. And uh, the theme behind this is, uh, is funding and thinking of ahead as a potential way to infuse more funds into our community. Um, and collaboration, uh, it, it, it needs to begin there, uh, extremely important. Um, we need a governance structure that supports collaboration, that understands the impacts on costs given access and um, gaps in accessibility um, across the care continuum. Um, and our focus uh, here as a healthcare system, as a hospital, is uh, that we really wanna provide the right care at the right time with the right providers. Um, but unfortunately, this requires significant resources and infrastructure, many of which um, are not adequate in the state at this point. Um, requires full access to primary care, acute hospital care, mental health, home health, post-acute care, long-term care, um, and then an EMS service to transport patients to the right location. Um, that uh, structured and layered on with a uh, an engaged and connected care coordination team, vital to make sure that we're navigating these patients and providing them with information and coordination to seek care. Um, without this network, um, hospitals like Rutland are really gonna uh, face providing care that the AHEAD model would consider as being potentially avoidable. That's a significant concern for us. Um, in fact, one of the greatest issues and drivers of uh, potentially avoidable utilization um, is the lack uh, of uh, bed availability. And uh, for those of you who have um, allowed me to, um, uh, to speak before, this won't be new uh, information, but certainly uh, tertiary care facilities, long-term care facilities, residential treatment facilities, they all have collective um, access limits. Um, on, on bed availability or uh, just um, requirements on uh, admissions that delay um, and, re and require that we keep patients here in our hospital. Um, they also increase demand for emergency services. All of this pre prevents our patients from really receiving that timely care um, in, in, in the, the care uh, setting that it should be delivered. At Rutland, um, on any given day, 10% of our inpatient volume 
um, is related to uh, patients who do not require acute hospital care, but unfortunately their reality is there's no place else for them to go to have their, their care needs met. Uh, this is not uh, unique to Rutland. Uh, it's it's prevalent across the state. Um, these patients tend to stay with us a very long time. Uh, we've got a patient here uh, who's awaited placement for more than 600 days. Um, so very, very acute issue here. Um, and while considered potentially avoidable in the in the model um, and requirements for a head, um, the fact of the matter is hospitals are serving as safety nets and and for us, we're providing essential care to these patients who don't have other options. And so we're very concerned in the AHEAD model uh, about the definition and the requirements and uh, related to the uh, potentially avoidable utilization. Um, we also believe, um, and through tracking and sharing information with uh, the Green Mountain Care Board, that there are access issues uh, in our state. And we're concerned that the AHEAD model uh, does not provide a pathway for improved access to specialty care, hospital services, and primary care. Um, and the reason for that is if we look at the model um, and we think of that model as looking back three years to set uh, to set rates uh, and set budgets um, with a time where we had um, excessive wait times and capacity limitations, we bake uh, that that issue into some of those funding. And so really wanting to think about and be creative and how we can meet our collective goals to increase access to care, to drive wait times down um, and find a funding mechanism that's appropriate uh, for those uh, types of services. Uh, which leads me to why Rutland Regional uh, signed a letter of interest uh, uh, for this model, because we believe it is a tool that Vermont may have uh, that would allow an increase in payments from the federal payers to address some of these infrastructure uh, challenges and, and access uh, challenges. Um, if the state were selected to participate in the AHEAD model, uh, we believe that um, in order to be successful in supporting access to care and beginning to address affordability um, uh, issues, several head uh, model requirements would need to be put in place. Uh, front uh, and center in that is increased Medicare funding. Uh, we, we think that is uh, critical um, and uh, is uh, uh, a kind of a go-no-go -no -go situation for Vermont. Um, it would allow a healthcare affordability for uh, Vermonters um, and provide some financial stability for our care providers, primary care and um, hospitals throughout um, uh, the state. Um, and we believe we have um, an opportunity to, to go to a negotiating table that um, with some strength, um, if we look at ahead funding and acknowledge that Vermont is a low-cost Medicare healthcare provider, um, and uh, and that we've uh, consistently generated savings for the Medicare program. In fact, if we compare Vermont costs to other states and look at that median cost, uh, Vermont savings would be close to three hundred million dollars, and uh, meaning that Vermont's uh, hospitals are paid three hundred million dollars less for providing the same services. So, if we were to move it forward with the AHEAD model, the model should provide mechanisms to make Vermont hospitals more financially stable, to allow for reinvestment in services and infrastructure that improve access to care. So not just hospital uh, balance sheets and funding, uh, but uh, funding across the care continuum. Um, and, and this all lies with increased, uh, you know, this negotiation for funding. A lot of, uh, a number of Vermont hospitals lose money annually in our Medicare population. Um, and so this funding would be critical to ensure that long-term viability, but as importantly, um, additional Medicare funding would also support a fill up, uh, affordability concerns with our commercial insurers. And I, I think this is really important uh, to try to connect the dots here in that um, our commercial insurers would not be positioned uh, to subsidize Medicare losses to the extent they do today um, if we can share up Medicare funding. And this is extremely important so that we keep Vermonters in the state of Vermont uh, to receive care and they're not looking to go out of state. 
um, as we consider the healthcare ecosystem and consider the value of care provided across our care continuum, uh, we need to, to be not short-sighted. Um, hospital, I'm going to uh, advocate for hospital funding, but really important uh, that we also think about our care partners in our community, primary care, designated agencies, uh, substance use treatment services, home health providers, skilled nursing facilities, all important, again, to ensure that we don't have any of those gaps in care um, and patients get bottlenecked in receiving services in a, in a, a care setting that may be inappropriate. And I'll just uh, end with the data. We see data as we understand the AHEAD model as being uh, something at risk um, and, and a step back from where we are today. If we think about how we participate um, in the all payer model and the data that we get from one care. Um, as we understand it, it's fair, fairly siloed where uh, participants would receive their own data from uh, Medicare and uh, not necessarily shared from a community perspective. Uh, that's problematic uh, for um, a community like Rutland. We do not own primary care. Um, and so um, if not for data sharing, we wouldn't have that opportunity to see a comprehensive data set that would allow us to identify opportunities um, to improve care delivery, to ensure that we really are um, uh, committed to uh, providing the right care um, in the right setting with the right provider. Uh, we do have this data uh, op opportunity and availability with our all payer model. And that is something we feel very strongly that would need to continue um, if we were to move forward with the, with the AHEAD model. Um, as for Rutland, we have a long history of uh, trying to uh, work in partnership with uh, reform efforts. Uh, we are uh, really uh, trying to understand uh, how we can participate and move uh, care forward in our community. Um, we believe um, in uh, transformation models, but we also know uh, that they're extremely cumbersome, different, disruptive at times. Um, but we, we're, we're interested not only for increased funding, but we do believe there's an opportunity to improve equity, health equity, uh, to um, support our infrastructure and those gaps to increase that patient access uh, to clinical services, financial st uh, stability for our hospitals, um, stimulating um, some growth and creation of uh, access for post-acute care services and transportation. So while we, may, uh, we remain optimistic here in Rutland that we can achieve these objectives if efficiently designed um, and negotiated um, within the AHEAD model, we also understand that the complexity of the payment reform coupled with the need to negotiate uh, for these payment terms and model requirements could challenge Vermont and result in the need to reconsider moving forward. Uh, so just to summarize, really looking for ahead to infuse funding into the state uh, to really take care of some of our infrastructure access issues, uh, to respond to some of the concerns that we have in wait times and access to care for our community, uh, and not wanting to take a step back in some of those uh, payment reform activities that we've per uh, and care delivery reform activities we've participated in one care that have been really fueled by lots of good data uh, to allow us to really pinpoint some opportunities and concerns in, in our community. Thank you. <clears throat> um, might be a good time to take a seven minute break. Why don't we come back at um or an eight minute. We'll come back at 3.05, just take a short break. And I skipped um, Mr. Garland and Ms. Mullman. So when we come back, we'll go to um, Andrew Garland and Mary Kate and then back on order. So we'll see you at 3.05. Um, uh, Mr. Garland, I believe you are up next. Thanks for being here. Thank you, and I'm just... Thank you, and I'm just... Um, why don't we, uh, why don't we, uh, do you have a phone on as well or something? Right, we're going to skip Mr. Garland for now. <laughs> no, it's Andrew. Um, we'll see if we can get that to work out on the audio. Um, Ms. Mullman, are you ready to go? Do you want to share your thoughts? I, sure, happy to. 
Um, <clears throat> first of all, Mary Kate Molden. I'm director of Vermont Public Policy at Bi State Primary Care Association. Uh, we support federally qualified health centers in both Vermont and New Hampshire. I obviously will be speaking towards the Vermont side. Uh, we also support Vermont's free and referral clinics and uh, Northern New England uh, Planned Parenthood. Um, so first of all, thank you for hosting this, this, this gathering of um, important voices to hear. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, a lot of what I have to say will echoes a lot of what you've already heard. So I'll try to pick out those points that are most salient to our members. Uh, I also want to kind of echo a lot of what Pat said and that there is a lot to learn still about this model and the specifics of how it will be implemented. And I think those specifics um, will really give us a better understanding of how this will impact uh, our members, at least. So we're 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 constantly trying to learn more and and then give that feedback back to our members so that we can understand for them how it's going to impact. Um, but in general, right now, FQHCs are really struggling. Um, funding streams are declining or flatlined and costs are increasing. Uh, many health centers are looking at significant operational losses, uh, some as high as in the seven digits. And in these situations, the first services um, that go are the ones that we as a state keep pointing to as key to slowing the growth of healthcare costs. For example, we often point to pharmacy as one of the biggest contributors to high healthcare costs. And, um, but programs that could mitigate. I think it's Andrew. Sorry, I'm hearing some echo someone. Okay. Um, programs that could mitigate the need for pharmaceutical approaches. These are programs that promote nutrition, physical activity or mobility, or social support networks. These are cut when budgets get lean. Um, also, staff and services get cut, and this affects access and especially equity to access. Um, those who historically or currently have the highest access challenges will be probably the first affected as you start to cut back these services when these budgets are so lean. So the need to invest and support primary care is, is really real, and especially in the in the health center, health center FQHC side. Uh, so we really appreciate the AHEADS model focus on primary care and elevating it as an area for reform. Um, that the, the focus on the integrated multidiscipline care, such as integration of mental health, substance use disorder treatment, those are really at the heart of the FQHC model. And we really appreciate that um, that CMI has pointed to that as, as critical to this next phase in healthcare reform. Uh, but the de details really matter. So the 17 p.m. p.m., um, we've seen AHS put out some numbers and it looks like at least for the Medicare population, that could be a net gain, but we still need to understand more of those numbers and also how, what it looks like in the context of the other payers. Um, so again, like how would, as more Vermonters shift to MA plans, how might that affect the net funding that goes to our health centers? Um, as we transition away from the all payer model, what happens to the ACO payments and how does that affect the net uh, revenue for our members. We don't want to make the situation worse. It's already really slim. Uh, so we really need to understand those numbers. Um, and then again, sort of understanding that participation from other payers. I think Vermont Medicaid, I want to applaud them for being as really as cutting edge as they have been with their next generation ACO approach. Um, the fact that they have gone out there and it's an un unreconciled population based payment, that's 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 what we need more of. Um, but I would also want to understand more about how that funding has trickled down and impacted primary care, not just within the hospitals, but also across the system. Uh, we've talked a lot about how healthcare reform really needs to pivot and build off of primary care. It's not just primary care, I will say other aspects of the healthcare, but there has been a lot of focus on primary care. And I don't think we've seen the investments to, at, to date um, to really match that uh, rhetoric. But I will, I do also, you know, just to be fair, I wanna call out and I wanna express my appreciation to Diva that they are working with each of our health centers um, 
to update each of the health centers federally required minimum payments so that it does reflect their current scope of services and their current population serves. Um, and I also want to say I was pleased to see that in the state's AHEAD model application, they mentioned the alternative payment methodology report that was submitted to the legislature last fall. There was a lot of work that went into developing that payment model, and it's a model that really does a good job of reflecting the um, accurate reflecting the cost of providing comprehensive integrated care that really is at the heart of what FQHCs do. Um, and so we by state and our members really hope that the state is serious about considering implementing that payment model as part of the broader multi-payer approach in the AHEAD model and the shift to value-based care, assuming this is the direction the state's heading in. Um, also learning more about the commercial payers role. Payers don't or they shouldn't treat patients differently based on their coverage. And so we like having different siloed approaches for care management, care coordination, quality reporting is a real burden on providers and does a disservice to the patients to have that kind of segmented care structure within a single organization. So having more of the payers at the table and alignment across those payers in terms of the care coordination quality, uh, care management, support services, that, that, that's really what serves the patient. Um, so we would want to see some more information on how those pieces are going to come together. And I'm sure you've heard this word a couple times already, but administrative burden, this is really, this is another massive stress on our primary care providers and at the health centers. Um, and, and it's hurting our workforce and we need a workforce to provide this essential care to Vermonters. Um, and when you have workforce that's spending too much time on paperwork, when practices are spending resources on administration, not care, when clinically necessary care is not paid for, then staff leave, services are cut, access is reduced and this primarily hurts Vermonters. Um, so I, I think I'd love to see more about how this model can um, potentially alleviate some of these these weights on our on our primary care providers. Uh, I think learning uh, to in summary, just learning more about what the specifics are about the implementation is is critical, and the global budgets. Um, and I know these are coming, but it's something that we're really watching carefully. And the head model and the global budgets that the success of both of those will really require not just a robust primary care system, but also the other parts of the healthcare system, which really helps making sure patients are getting the right care in the right place at an appropriate level of care at an appropriate timing for that care, like making sure you get that primary preventive care as opposed to um, that emergency or acute care because you waited too long. Um, I also want to that there's a lot of this support will really come down to funding, but I also want to call out the funding alone is not the only issue. Uh, it's not going to solve everything. You've, if you just throw a lot of money at the problem, I'm not sure we're going to fix the underlying problem. So really having some strong uh, leadership and a clear vision about how all of these pieces are going to fit together. Uh, people have mentioned the complexity of this, and Pat, I do not envy the the jigsaw puzzle, the 3D jigsaw puzzle with no cover or picture to draw from that you're you're trying to do. Like I, I just want to appreciate that, but there needs to be a real strong um, leadership in in helping make it clear how those pieces fit together and how the different partners in the system can step up and work together. Uh, and I, I think you heard echoes of that in people's comments on the governance and the complexity. So uh, I think that's where I'll leave it. Um, and uh, just again, it's all reminding everyone that the, the heart of this is it's, it's the Vermonter. It's making sure they're getting the care in the right place at the right time, um, at the right in the right setting. So again, thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Kern, you want to try your audio again? Yeah, hopefully this is better. How am I doing? 
All right. Sounds great. Uh, what I was Thanks. Saying was I hope I'm not the one creating the echo. <laughs> ironically, uh, okay. So um, I've been uh, I've been surgically uh, going through my notes here, trying to cut out everything that everybody's already said. And I, I will say, not only do I think almost every single point I wanted to make uh, has already been made, but I've written down a ton of uh, really thoughtful comments uh, from everyone who has spoken before me. I think the dialogue is right on. Um, so I'll try to just give you a few thoughts that bring the perspective of Vermont's uh, local non-for-profit health plan uh, to the picture, um, very similarly aligned with what we've heard. Um, we hear from our members every day, they need us to find ways to help move this healthcare system forward. We're spending too much money and we're not providing for everybody's needs. So I, I would frame, I think Blue Cross would frame our primary challenges as affordability and access. Um, I think it's so important that we're having this discussion, that we're evaluating this model, um, that we evaluate every opportunity that comes in, in front of us. Um, but I hope that we will make our decision on whether or not to proceed here um, based on fact and not be afraid to say no to this model if it does not address our needs and move on to the next best alternatives, which I'm sure there are many. And I, I wanna thank you, Pat, for mentioning the portfolio approach um, because we strongly believe that there is not a single magic bullet here um, that is going to move our healthcare system where it needs to go, right? We have dozens of major challenges, and there is no model comprehensive enough to take them all on at once. Um, so, a really important comment. And, and the other thing I wanted to say just at the outset um, is that we're probably not going to create the value we lead, uh, we need for Vermont if we let CMMI lead us forward on this. Um, we need our Vermont leadership to step forward and drive us forward to where we need to go. Um, I said to a colleague that, you know, CMMI will um, boil our frog uh, if we let them. Um, and I think it's important for us to recognize, um, as Judy said so eloquently, um, Medicare is not putting a lot on the table for us here. Um, and they have created a massive cost shift in our state um, that is making commercial care our commercial uh, health insurance almost unaffordable at this point, um, or in, in, in unobtainable. <laughs> uh, it's certainly unaffordable. Um, so I, I think we're very right to ask our, you know, does this model bring enough resources from CMS uh, into Vermont? And if not, um, what are other ways we could pursue those resources? Um, there are certainly other, other avenues that we could think about. So, so I talked just a little bit about complexity. Um, I, Blue Cross is very supportive of any efforts that simplify the system, but I'll just make the point that if we're only sort of simplifying, uh, as a lot of people have said already on this meeting, we're probably making things more complicated. Um, and I think this is, this is likely to be one of those cases. Um, and I'll just offer a few points that I think support this, this thinking. Um, global risk sharing models, for example, um, they, Establishing and tending to the methodology that goes with the global risk share takes an unbelievable amount of energy uh, and effort. It, and it's not one and done, right? And frankly, from the Blue Cross perspective, we have been negotiating or we were negotiating with One Care Vermont to find the right methodology from about two years before we started that program um, to the day we said um, Blue Cross won't be able to continue supporting this program right now. Um, a constant negotiation about methodology. Um, that negotiation distracts us, right? It adds cost, it complicates our alignment, makes it hard to communicate up and down. Um, and it mo most importantly, it pulls our leaders away from focusing on the problems or, or the opportunities to make uh, meaningful change. And the more global the risk, um, the less room there is for mistakes. And that and that's the real point, right? When, when a Blue Cross or uh, a major hospital is sitting down to look at a global budget methodology or a global risk methodology, there is no room for error in this system, right? And we're talking about a methodology that may come with dozens of factors or uh, adjustments, right, to consider. There is no room for, for error, not by Blue Cross, not on behalf of our members, not by any of our hospital partners. Um, no one could afford to, to lose in a model like this because we didn't get the methodology right, which means we have an almost infinite regrets of arguing about the methodology. Um, and it's fear-based, right? It, it doesn't empower us, uh, it makes us afraid. Um, 
as many people have said, these CMMI models, and I've participated in a few in Vermont and outside of Vermont, um, they come with a huge additional administrative layer. Um, and it, again, this distracts us. Um, we just came out of a legislative session where administrative burden um, was one of the one of the themes of, of many of the conversations that I was a part of. Um, do our Vermont providers have the capacity to take on more administrative burden? And I would just um, remind everybody that it's not only providers um, who get pulled into this. I, I see people sometimes offering the one care cumulative administrative budget as a, a good placeholder for what we've spent on the all payer model. But state agencies, designated agencies, health plans, um, the you know many of the people on this call, I mean, there's so much administrative um, work behind making these work, um, which doesn't mean that we shouldn't do them. Uh, it just means that we need to be really confident that the evidence says we're going to create the value we need uh, and that that value outweighs the, the administrative work we're asking everybody to take on. So for evidence, um, I really have just one question here. Do, do we feel like we have enough evidence um, to step into a 10 year all payer model that doesn't seem to come with a lot of money or a lot of flexibility. Um, and I understand that the Medicare waiver is very valuable, but there's not a lot more that Medicare is putting on the table. And it's not clear that this model that they're offering goes at what Vermont needs. As I said, I, I think we're looking primarily from our perspective at affordability and an access. But when I look at this model from a high level, and I know you're working really hard on this, Pat, and I appreciate it. I see a model that seems to be trying to solve for overutilization. Um, that, that seems to be the construct here. And I'm, I'm not sure any of us would raise our hand and say, yeah, we think overutilization is the big problem that we're struggling with here in Vermont. Um, I, I don't think that's it. Uh, and just another thing to say about CMMI models, um, like this one, they're not usually tested. Uh, before we jump into them, right? Um, there's a lot of concept, a lot of high high concept thinking, and I think that thinking is very energizing and exciting. There's a lot of information there. We should take it and make the most of it, but we should acknowledge that this doesn't has not been tested, um, and our market is a very irregular market um, <laughs> to try to test uh, something like this that doesn't seem to be designed to do what we need to do. Uh, just a few quick points about structure, structure of this model. Um, what incentives are we thinking we're bringing to the table here? Um, you know, with, with the built-in inflators, the inevitable off-ramps that we're going to have to build into this global budget methodology, I, I'm not seeing how we drive forward of affordability and access. Um, but those things don't really seem to be what this model is about. Um, and certainly it doesn't provoke us to have the hard conversations that I think we all know we need to really have. We've heard many of them alluded to in this in this session already. Um, but you know, are we really engineering the healthcare system that Vermont needs? Um, or is this just another program that you know will probably accomplish something? but will also take us away from driving toward the most important questions about how we manage all of these resources um, so that the people who need them can actually afford them. A, a couple of other structural thoughts that occurred to me, these are pretty small potatoes, but I think they're worth mentioning. Most of our hospitals and independent practices are multi-state operations. Um, maybe there's a few right down the middle who don't get anybody from New York, Massachusetts, or New Hampshire, um, but I think most of our, our practices are our multi-state operations. Um, and I just wonder if the Vermont only solution is enough. And again, going back to that point, if we're only sort of simplifying, are we actually simplifying or are we just adding more complexity? Um, I'll just off also mention that people may not realize this, but there's a lot of people who access our healthcare system that do not live and work in Vermont. Uh, many of them are Vermonters on paper, many of them are part-time Vermonters, and many of them are people who just choose to spend time here, um, but they're not necessarily covered here or participating in our system um, fully. So there's just another layer of complexity that a Vermont-only solution um, brings that might actually make this more complex and not uh, more simple as I think we would all like it to be. Another question, do we see adequate focus on mental health, substance abuse disorder, access to long-term uh, care beds, access to primary care? You know, when I talk to clinicians or clinical leaders, these are the themes that I'm hearing over and over and over again, right? Um, 
this model does not, again, doesn't seem to be designed uh, to solve those challenges. I think we could point it at some of them, uh, and Pat's really creative, and I know we'll keep working and thinking about ways to, to bring those other considerations to the table, but fundamentally, that's not what this model is about. Um, PCP ahead, my, my questions there are very similar. I, I love what it represents on paper. We absolutely need to invest more in this primary care system. I'm not sure that this model does much of that. <laughs> it's not it's not that easy to see. And I, I empathize with the concerns that many, many of the providers uh, who've spoken earlier on the call um, laid out in front of us. And I'm, I'm also afraid that if we do find a way to invest more in primary care uh, in this model, we're going to turn right around and ask our, our consumers um, to fund that. And I don't think they can afford it. Um, I know they can't afford it. We, we have to find other ways uh, to solve these challenges than keep going back to the commercial market and saying, pay more, pay more, pay more. Um, that, that capacity is tapped out. So to me, that means we have to look to the hospital side of the line and ask ourselves, can we, can we find a way to bring dollars from the hospital spend, which data tells us is probably too high, uh, to the primary care spend, which data tells us is probably too low. Um, Again, the model doesn't really <laughs> do that for us. Um, and, and I guess maybe maybe my more important point is I don't know that we need the model to do that ourselves. Um, I don't see much besides eight, $10 million from Medicare that this model brings to Vermont that the board could not do on its own um, or that this group couldn't do in a way that serves our needs a lot better, I think, than a CMMI program would. Um, so I, I would ask again, is this is this in, is there enough investment in our community uh, for the effort here, or could we find other ways to accomplish some of these things? Um, final thought: uh, we have to know how we're going to measure success, and and I mean crystal clear, uh, because if we're not arguing with one care about how we should set the methodology, uh, and I I say this kindly to my one care friends, uh, we're arguing about whether or not we accomplish something. Um, it is really hard to know, right? When you when you embrace and embark on these broad-based social engineering projects um, with so many variables, did we move the needle? Did we do anything here? Um, and it it creates a lot of bad energy and distraction for all of us as we try to focus on on real change. So uh, if we do move forward with this model or something like it. Um, I encourage us to make sure we know how we're going to measure and to be dynamic, um, locked into something for 10 years that doesn't offer us the ability to sense and respond to what's going on the ground um, is not likely to serve us very well. Um, we, we need to be able to understand where we're being successful, where we're falling behind, and make changes in real time. Um, you know, locking ourselves in for five or seven or eight or 10 years um, that's that's a hard course to see uh, really delivering value for us. So thanks very much. Uh, that's really all I have to say. And like Susan Ritson, I'm I'm so appreciative uh, for this dialogue. I don't I don't think this happens everywhere. Um, so thank you everybody for for making making this a reality. Well, thank you for saying that. And we're extremely appreciative of everyone taking the time to do this for us to help us understand. So thank you again, everyone. Um, uh, John Aislin. I'm John Aislin. I'm the CEO and CFO for Primary Care Health Partners. Uh, we're the largest group of independent primary care practitioners in the state. We're a group, uh, not an association. So we have offices. We have 10 medical offices in Vermont, ranging from Bennington and Brattleboro right up to Newport and Unisburg Falls. So we are, we're, we're pretty spread over. About 50 practitioners serving about uh, 35,000 uh, patients in Vermont. Um, I guess I'm glad to know that uh, when I when I read this the application, it just seemed like I didn't get a clear understanding where we're heading. And apparently, I'm not alone. Uh, so there are so many questions out there. And but I but 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 in saying that, I I just want to express my appreciation for HS and the hard work and putting the application together. I I I can see how incredible it must have been to have submitted this. And I thank Pat for your comment earlier where you said. The next step is getting understanding so we can see the value. And it seems that getting that understanding is trying to grasp all these questions and, and bring that information back. Uh, back, And it seems it requires some ongoing negotiation post-election. But um, I, I, I thought, well, you know, rather than 
trying to go through all the questions. I, I just want maybe for, from my perspective, I just want to touch a little more on the CPR aspect of it, not that it's part of a head. Um, it, that, if anything, for us, that's probably the most concerning thing is that we feel like the CPR program, which we've been a participant in for seven years, we feel like there's a dismantling of it. And it, it, it I could see you're not going to complain about it uh, leaving, and you could just say, well, you know, there's the, staying the course really isn't the option. But I can't tell you how much, I try to tell you how much CPR has been of value to our group, and, and, and I know we're not alone. Um, it, it has brought stability to primary care um, right from incep inception in 2018 and certainly helped through COVID. Um, but it was more than stability for, for, for our independent practices. Um, it offered us an opportunity to collaborate with, with the hospitals, to be sitting at the same table and having discussions about uh, healthcare delivery in the state. I can't imagine any other forum that had that kind of a collaborative opportunity. And it's and I fear the loss of that collaborative opportunity as we transition to this new Medicare-driven, CMS-driven, whatever uh, model. But CPR went even beyond that in, in, in delivering greater investments to the primary care practices to really to provide enhanced uh, mental health funding beyond Blueprint to be providing care innovation opportunities like remote patient monitoring to be just giving us the, the, the room to breathe, to explore other opportunities to, to maybe develop, we did develop better patient management tools that we could look at the patients that have the challenges, not the numbers. And it was all done by this investment that came through the One Care CPR program. And it seems that basically with the head that, that the Medicare program is going to End, and and I don't know what it really means for the Medicaid program. Could, can that possibly survive? But and, and out of, it gives you a bunch of questions out of there, right? And, and and the big question is, if CPR is going away, I, what is the crosswalk to what what's happening? What, because are we losing fund funding now in the new Medicare program? If it means losing funding, it means going back to all of these opportunities and these things that we've been doing to enhance patient care and figure out how to pull back. You know, I mean, one of the biggest fears we always have when when, when new money is, is pushed to develop programs is that it won't last. And that suddenly we're left with, with, with a structure that now we've got to own and figure out how to fund or dissolve. And, uh, you know, we, we've, Every opportunity you've heard us uh, advocate, I'm saying my, myself, Dr. Sackoon is the chair of our group. We've advocated for CPR. We've seen the value for the group. We've done op-eds. We've, we've done all we can to try to be sure that CPR just continues. And it's it's just, it's disheartening to be in a situation where we feel we may be losing grip on it. And in you know, mind, I say that, but I look at the uh, the primary care ahead goals, and they talk about, oh, it's designed to increase the investment in primary care. It's aligning Medicare with state-led uh, Medicaid efforts, uh, in increasing overall uh, 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 capacity for care coordination, improving quality, offering whole person-centered care, minimizing provider burden. And you go back, well, minimizing provider burden, what, what is MIPS? Right, and so it, it 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 we're seeing the the words, but I don't know where we're heading. And I I I and I, I through the application again, I thank AHS. They're talking about building upon what's here in Vermont, and it's great. I don't know what 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 we'll be able to salvage. I I don't know whether what 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 could be left with C, with CPR. I don't know what one care is going to do. Will there be, you know, there's an organization that has been beneficial for CPR, and I just don't know what the long-term plan is. And AHS even acknowledges that throughout the application, right? There's big questions about what one what care's role is going to be. So I don't know what, you know, right now, I'm I, again, I'm glad to hear that everybody else is struggling as much as we are because I have no idea what Primary Health Partners is going to do. I fear that maybe this is going to be the only option. And we don't have an alternative. And it's probably you know making the best to go with this. Um, 
But I'm always obviously anxious to see, you know, what other opportunities, you know, is, is, is one character going to come up with something? There's talk about them doing maybe an MSSP model. I don't know, right? There's all this, there's discussion that was also in the application. So I, 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 I guess I should wrap up that uh, basically, you know, it's too bad that, that despite all that we've said to advocate for CPR and how far it has taken us, that we find ourselves like we're losing grip on it and falling back to something else. And uh, it, it I, I can only hope that somehow it turns out better. But right now, I, 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 I fear that uh, we got to start thinking about changing what we're doing and the programs that we started and how, how do we how do we how do we adjust for this? How do we find the collaboration that we or do we lose all the collaboration? We go back to our silos of just us. You know, I mean, there's so much fear and I'm hoping go back to Pat, your question. Maybe some of this will get resolved when you get more answers from CMS and we could think this through and truly see the value. Put that there. Thank you very much, Mr. Aislinn. Um, Mr. Wooden? Yep. Is that working? It is, yeah, we can hear you and see you. Great. I'm kind of exhausted. This is uh, just a lot to take in. I can't believe you guys do this all the time with this much input. I appreciate all that you do, but it's a lot. And I'm, I only now and then tip my toe in the water. So thanks for what you do. It's a lot to figure this out. I really appreciate everybody around the table, every organization and everybody participating. We're all Vermonters trying to figure out how to make the system better. I'm always reminded that in the three-legged stool, because I like to keep things simple, it's most about the cost of care. I know access is right behind and quality, but we tend to just talk about money a lot, which is kind of a disappointment <clears throat> when you also we all should be looking at quality as well as access. I want to sort of broadly say that in many cases, we have to be leaders. And there's, um, I don't know, thousands of books each year that get put out by leaders. I've never found the book yet. Maybe somebody knows the book on how to be a really good follower. Those books don't get written, right? How do you become a good follower? So Vermont's trying to be a leader. Once again, we represent very small percentage of the population. It's actually about 0.2%. It's not even 1%. And uh, to me, it's hard to understand how ourselves in Maryland, we've been through this road before with the ACO model. And we've talked about that for a long time. It's hard for me to understand how, but we're gonna sort of, once again, try to take the leadership role. I think in the ACO model that we looked at, and I know the comments um, were very helpful, you know, how do we measure it? What's the success? What are the failures? I fear that most of this discussion is always the pros on doing this. We got everybody all sales up, let's do it. And we talk about the pros. We never talk about what are the, the cons? What are the pitfalls? What are our top 10 concerns? What did we learn about the previous healthcare reform? That, that makes me scared. That makes me worried. I can't run this organization at Copley, I work at Copley, I couldn't run Copley that way. Most businesses can't run that way, but I sort of feel like we are just going to the next answer as opposed to thoughtfully just thinking about what should we do uh, and what should we hold off on. So um, the pressure to make a decision also is concerning to me when all of a sudden we sort of feel like we've got to make a decision and the commitment being so many years and when we say there's a chance to get out of this, the chances get significantly diminished the more time you spend into it. I mean, that's actually correlated. The more time you spend with somebody or an issue, I mean, there's a lot of psychology around that, that the higher the chances, you're going to be part of the team, you're going to say yes. So we're spending a lot of time on this, we have a lot of data, a lot of charts. I just want to express my concern that we don't know enough about it. Half a dozen or more people said they don't fully understand it. And these are people in the healthcare field. We're not, we're not talking about just somebody on the street. This is very confusing. And I do love the KISS principle with your messaging. And we, we're having a hard time messaging this to each other to really understand what are the levers, what are the positives, what are the negatives. So I just have a lot of red flags and I don't wanna see us um, 
waste time trying to lead when in fact we might want to just be a great follower and stick to the knitting, as I say, good old Vermont term, stick to the knitting of just making continuous improvements in the cost of care in Vermont amongst all the providers, as well as the access issues and some eye on quality, but there's a lot we could do right now without like signing up for a multi-year commitment. So I don't, I don't mean to be just a naysayer and, you know, throw, throw water on the campfire. I just want us to be realistic about this. And then the politics in America, I don't know if anybody is aware, I consider this year probably going to be the most interesting years I will ever remember because by the end of this year, we're going to vote and we're going to have a existing president or a new president and, um, uh, that can throw everything out the window. Do we do we not know that? We know that when we did the last presidential change, stuff can be just changed like that. And so if we sign up for a model not knowing the politics, and nobody knows the politics at this point, I just think that's a risk. Um, lastly, Copley is a critical access hospital. There's eight of them in the state. We get additional some additional reimbursement for some costs through Medicare because of our small size and the recognition that you need diversity of healthcare settings. There's about 1,300 of them in the country, maybe 1,400. So for us, this doesn't look that appealing because it introduces a lot of risk. It was same, same was true for the ACO model. So even if we go down this road, it's hard to sort of take the current, but we're very small. We're only three, two or three percent of the entire state's hospital budgets, but um, it's hard for us to sort of see that for us it would be a valuable. Uh, lastly, I'm going to just make a comment about grants. I think it's easy to chase grant money. I think it's easy to not figure out what you're going to do after the money runs out. And um, grant money can sometimes take us away from actually making good objective progress. Grant money tends to focus people as opposed to having them focus creatively as to how best to fix the system or save costs or improve efficiency or coordination. So I got a I got a great article, Seven Costs on the Money Chase, how focus on funding influences progress. And that's not in a good way. So we just got to be careful because if we're chasing and lauding the tail, it, it, in the end, it just doesn't sort of make sense, even though it's money and it sounds like a lot of money, but relative to our, you know, just the hospital side is $3.5 billion, never mind all the other uh, profit, nonprofit, even Dartmouth, which we don't consider. They do a great job, but they're not part of our system, unfortunately. So I just have a lot of red flags. So I apologize. I'm just sharing those. I appreciate everybody's work. I don't have the magic answer. I know. Less is more and keep it simple. We might actually be able to get on board, but it, it feels like it's beyond rocket science, some of these constructs. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Woodman. Uh, Mr. Benson, Rick Benson. Good afternoon. I'm Rick Benson. I'm the CFO of the UVM Health Network. Um, lived in Vermont my whole life, grew up in a little town in the in the Northeast Kingdom. So obviously, the discussion today is is very important to me not, not only in my my day role but i have many family members that um, that utilize healthcare throughout uh, vermont so thank you for the for the opportunity to uh, to share some comments uh, today i also want to thank everybody that's gone before me and it looks like a few people that are going to come after me for the words and the feelings uh, that they've shared um, especially those that provide direct patient care the, the passion and the energy that John just shared in his comments, um, you know, wherever we land uh, in this uh, journey, uh, we want to make sure that the model appropriately values the expertise uh, and the effort that our writers are putting into taking care of patients and that uh, we don't have a model that somehow um, negatively impacts access to that excellent care that, uh, that our providers are, are providing. Um, as the board knows, um, uh, as Judy shared for Rutland, uh, the UVM Health Network also did submit a non-binding letter of interest for the state's AHEAD uh, application. Uh, we did this because we do think that there's uh, there's an opportunity uh, with AHEAD to at least explore um, as it potentially aligns with uh, the interests that we have in shifting 
payment and delivery system in Vermont to be more grounded in, in value-based uh, care. Um, it highlights the potential for uh, improving funds flow to primary care, uh, providing stability for uh, hospital levels of care, and supporting the, the, the beneficiary uh, connections to community resources. So all of these things that, are, that have been highlighted in, in the CMI ahead model, we certainly, uh, we certainly value. Just in the interest of time, I'll just highlight a few, as many people have said, um, some of my comments are, are going to be repetitive. So I'm just going to maybe zero in on a little bit more of the kind of the technical things um, that we will we will be looking for in terms of the, the AHEAD model. Um, we did submit, a, for those uh, of you who are not aware, we did submit a letter to, to, to Secretary Samuelson and her team on, on areas that we flagged. Um, as important as the the negotiations with uh, CMI CMMI are ongoing, so there's three areas. Uh, one was the administration uh, of the model, uh, two was financial stability, and then the third, which I think you've heard uh, multiple times, was data and uh, reporting. In terms of administration of the the model, uh, we want to make sure that we have a transparent, predictable model that's grounded in actuarially derived to risk risk adjusted uh, per capita cost targets. Um, that's 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 important that the model um, include that and that we need a, a representative body of clinical financial experts, Green Mountain Care Board representation to advise the model. We will make sure we have plenty of of, of expertise and um, uh, diverse um, backgrounds uh, in terms of the team that is advising this model. In terms of financial stability, um, as um, everybody has, has uh, or many people have highlighted already, it does highlight and actually quotes um, that one of the goals is to provide financial stability for hospitals. Um, we view that as, as, as incredibly important. I think Judy uh, touched on this a little bit. I think actually Andrew uh, might have touched us on this as well. Vermont has long been one of the lowest cost Medicare states in the country. Um, so it'll be important for stability that we um, that we're rewarded and not penalized uh, for that for that low cost uh, delivery and high quality of healthcare that will help with the cost shift and take some pressure off commercial rates. So we 100% support uh, the proposal that um, that Pat and her team have put forward in terms of increasing the baseline budgets by 10% uh, in the first year uh, of the model. Uh, next, we need to make sure that the model is responsive to the growing and aging demographics um, that we have in the state. So we're going to need, from our perspective, a Vermont-specific trend, not a regional uh, growth trend. Uh, we need to account for the limited access that we're currently experiencing in our state and incorporate annual updates reflecting where services are being provided. And then lastly, as has been mentioned uh, multiple times, uh, we need to recognize mental health, substance use disorder, post-acute systems are collapsing under the weight of historic underfunding. Um, we need those systems to deliver the care that Vermonters deserve, uh, and this model needs to be responsive to those systems of care. And as I think everybody knows, uh, those systems of care um, operate outside the four walls of our hospitals, so we need to make sure in this model that, um, that those are addressed. Uh, the last area, data and reporting, uh, to be effective, we do need ready access to timely data. We need regular all claims uh, payer feeds that go directly to the participating providers. And then we do need, as we have in the ACO, the, the, the waivers necessary to actually act upon uh, that data to improve the, the health of our patients. And this, again, has been said multiple times, we need uh, to make sure that the negotiated model does not add to the administrative burdens, either through quality reporting or the regulatory uh, requirements uh, of the model. So everything I've shared so far is based on our current understanding of the model, and thank you to, um, to Pat and her team um, who have, uh, have been key to kind of highlighting uh, what they know as well um, in terms of what the model is telling us today. 
when we do get more information uh, and we see the final model, we will review that um, as a health network through the lens of our patients, our rate payers and our communities. Um, our analysis will certainly focus on whether the underfunding of federal and state payers will continue to put pressure on our rate payers and potentially access um, to care. And then finally, uh, we look forward to, to continuing to work with the state to understand the details of the model as they um, as they continue to, to to roll out and the negotiations uh, continue with CMMI. So thank you for the opportunity to share our comments. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, Ms. Green, Devin Green. Thanks, Chair Foster. Quick question. Are we ending at four or are we going to roll over? Um, we can roll over. Okay, great. Um, so thank you for having me here today. My name is Devin Green. I'm with the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems. We represent Vermont's hospitals, all of which are nonprofit. And want to say that we really appreciate the board seeking our input. We know AHS and the Green Mountain Care Board have met with providers a number of times, and we appreciate that process. I would say overall for the AHEAD model, um, there is a lot of concern about the disruption that it could cause. And I agree that we have no room for error. Um, at the same time, it also feels like we can't afford to not explore all of our options. And so I do think it's worth exploring all of our options. Um, as we have them before us, whether it's the AHEAD model or fee-for-service or Medicare Shared Savings Program or some combination thereof. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit to the Vermont-specific Medicare global payment methodology and then uh, lead into other aspects of the AHEAD model, and I'll try to make it brief. I will say that I've agreed with a lot of the concepts that have been um, laid out here today. So in terms of the Vermont specific Medicare global payment methodology, we do appreciate that, first of all, that we're taking up this option and we're not just um, doing the Medicare methodology wholesale. So we appreciate that we're trying to do things a little bit differently for Vermont. We um, support the flexibility in setting the base um, and having an alternative option and taking the higher of the two in terms of setting the base for hospitals. Um, we also think it's really important that we get the Medicare total cost of care right. Um, we have done a lot in the state in terms of healthcare reform. We've saved Medicare a lot of money, and we think it's important that that be reflected in the total cost of care to provide room for Vermont to be innovative and improve access going forward. In terms of the adjustments under the global payment methodology, we think that the Vermont delivery reform investment adjustment is crucial. Um, and we see a lot of potential opportunity here. So we think within that there's an upper within either this uh, Vermont delivery reform uh, adjustment or uh, setting the base, we think there's a lot of opportunity to fulfill the Act 167 commitment to um, have value-based payments take into account the sustainability of Vermont's hospitals, so setting up hospitals for sustainability so that they can provide that care. We don't want to jeopardize access by locking in negative operating margins and making hospitals unsustainable. We think there is an opportunity to impact commercial rates. Again, if, as Ms. Fox said, we set ourselves up to the 50th percentile of where Medicare is, that will have an impact on rates. And then there's also a separate opportunity for health system transformation. So these are all things that we want to pursue. We know healthcare system transformation is very difficult to pursue without Medicare involved and so that's why we are taking an opportunity to look at the AHEAD model. Um, in terms of the inflation factor, we hope that the inflation factor could reflect the reality of what's happening to Vermont on the ground. We know that workforce is very 
is a very big piece of Vermont um, and that our aging workforce plays into it and that we're more negatively impacted than other areas of the country. So we would hope that that would be taken into account as we look at inflation. Uh, workforce is a huge contributor there. I think it's also worth taking into account in all of these um, adjustments, technology and innovation. So I want to make sure either in the inflation piece or elsewhere, we take into account the idea that as healthcare improves, that does tend to increase costs, but we probably want access to greater innovation and technology for Vermonters. And so how are we going to address this in that in this model as well? Um, and then in terms of the performance adjustments and the potential avoidable utilization, Vermont's median rate is lower than the national average, um, or Vermont is lower than the national average when it comes to the median rate. And so we do think that should be taken into account. I wanna really stress what um, Judy Fox said and others said about uh, how other parts of the system impact hospitals in terms of long-term care, mental health, um, transportation is a huge impact to hospitals and avoidable utilization and costs. And so we would want those take we would want that taken into account with this model as well. So that's what I have on the um, on the model piece in terms of on the um, on the global budget piece in terms of the model itself. I agree 100 percent that primary care can't lose its gains at point at this point. We've done so much to um, in the primary care world and um, it would it would be terrible to lose what we've done there in terms of trying to stabilize primary care and improve it. Um, I want to again mention critical access hospitals and take into account that critical access hospitals do not have economy of scale. They've really been set up to uh, address access in areas and Vermont has a lot of areas of need, geographic areas of need for access. And so when we look at our critical access hospitals and how this model impacts them, we do need to take that into account. And then in terms of data, again, we share the concern about data and how we share it and how we work with our community partners in terms of getting it so that we can make improvements in healthcare. And so we would wanna see more information about that. With governance and regulation, I think we do need more information in this area and how it will work. So Act 167 um, includes that the proposal for value-based care and global budget payments would ensure reasonable and adequate rates as well as a predictable schedule for updates. Um, and I think that predictability is really important. Delivery system changes are not going to happen if hospitals are unsure of what their budgets are going to be. Um, we can't invest in the future. We can't invest in community providers. We can't invest long-term if it's unsure what our budgets are going to be um, each year. So we are really looking at setting up a regulatory structure that is based in predictability and would allow for these things to happen. We also really encourage all areas of expertise to participate in both the governance structure and the regulatory process. I'll just note that Pennsylvania has payer and provider representation on its board. Maryland has payer representation, uh, a hospital CEO, and a vice president of provider and payment transformation that comes from Johns Hopkins Health System on its board. And so we would like to keep the communication open between the financial and administrative expertise, as well as the provider expertise in setting up these global hospital budgets, because as we mentioned, there's no room for error and we need to make sure um, that we're all aligned when it comes to these global hospital budgets. So moving forward, we really appreciate the Green Mountain Care Board and AHS's transparency in this process. As we potentially move into the negotiation process, we do wonder what that transparency will look like. Um, we know that negotiations with the federal government can often be a bit of a black box. And if that's going to, so I guess first of all, we would encourage to keep having these discussions with providers, with consumers, with payers, 
um, so that we we can all be well informed and marching to the same beat as we go forward. But um, if that's not possible, then I would propose that we do all sit down and come to some sort of agreement about what terms are there that we would walk away from, because I think there is a big concern about this being a little bit of an unstoppable force as we keep moving each step forward. And I think that could be relieved if we do have agreement on certain things that we're just not willing to negotiate. Um, and so with that, I will uh, see if there are any questions. Uh, thank you. Um, we'll hold board member comments or questions till um, till the end, just so we make sure we get through everyone. But thanks for being available for that. Um, uh, Trey Dobson, Dr. Dobson. Thank you. Um, I'm just trying to figure out how I can add additional comments to this. So I'll just pivot from what I plan to talk about, and I'll just move towards um, maybe my perspective as as a doctor rather than as a chief medical officer. So by the way, I'm Trey Dobson. I I work as a physician at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center half time and then half time at Southwestern Vermont Medical Center and then the other half time as the chief medical officer, which somehow equals uh, a full FTE. My, um, I I'll just support three things. I just wrote them down real quick that people have already said a little bit different perspective again, not from a chief medical officer, but from a doctor at the bedside. The first is really ensuring these services that, that Pat talked about in, in the initial presentation that are outside of a hospital. So now I'm focused on global budgets and how these other services impact. So let me start by saying, you know, 20 years ago when I started, or let's say 15 years ago, uh, I, I would be practicing and I'd come in to work in the morning or overnight, and there would be, you know, typically like one or two patients in a 20 bed emergency department that we really didn't have a great place to go. We were trying to figure out where to get them. And, you know, we'd eventually get them somewhere in a really long amount of time, like 12 to 16 hours. Uh, but that's quite different today. This is what, you know, Dr. Merman was talking about. And I think Judy alluded to when I go into work tomorrow. So tomorrow I'll go into the emergency department and just picture this. There's 20 beds. Five to seven of them will be occupied by people that have been there, not 12 or 16 hours, but more like 24 to 36 hours. And we tend to really feel for those patients and talk about you know, the difficulties in those patients, and that's true. But what we don't talk about is we've now just taken out five to seven beds, you know, taken them offline, and now we're trying to operate an emergency department with uh, 15 beds. So the capacity is much more limited. And if you think about this, you can run these numbers. So all the CFOs on this will enjoy this. You know, you, you get about, in our emergency department, 75 patients per day. They're coming through 20 beds. Of course, they don't all come. They don't come um, in a nice uniform way. They all come around noon. But the point is, is that we've got 20 beds to work with. Well, now we only have 15. The patients occupy the beds for two to three hours, except these others that are occupying it for 36 hours. What happens is all of a sudden the math just multiplies tremendously, and we have patients waiting in the waiting room who need to be seen. And that's really contrary to what people think. People think the emergency departments are clogged by ankle sprains and sore throats, and it's just not the case. I can see those patients in the hallway. I can see them quickly. It's the beds being occupied by individuals that we really don't have a place to put them. Uh, and then when the sick people come in, we're really stuck because we can't put those sick people in the hallway. I said I wasn't do this, but I'm going to give this terrible analogy. Um, it's a steady state in an emergency department and in a practice. You can kind of you know, use these analogies for a practice, but think about when you get on a ski lift and as the day goes on, the line backs up a little bit, but you know, it, hopefully in Vermont, not Colorado, the line doesn't back up too much and there's a steady state flow. But if you took out every 10th chair, what would happen is the line would just keep getting longer and longer and longer. There's no way to fight that because there's not enough chairs. That's, what hap that's what's happening in emergency departments right now and in an inpatient setting where they can't be discharged. All right, there's my terrible analogy. Second thing, um, you know, Pat, you didn't talk about this much, and I know I've seen some of the material, but there was a, a little bit of alluding to um, penalties or some type of incentive for avoidable utilization. And again, I will come at it from an emergency medicine perspective. You know, this stuff is really baloney. Um, it's based on 
uh, claims data, and it says things like, if you have a headache, you know, that's an avoidable utilization. Well, you know, I don't see a lot of minor headaches, but by the way, if I do, they're really easy to deal with. I see difficult headaches. If I see a sore throat, it's typically fairly difficult. They should be in the emergency department. We have an urgent care center. We have primary care centers. They go to those places that the patients self-select. So if we're going to penalize, or if any of the model talks about penalizing hospital systems based on what they call avoidable utilization, we're really double whammying these, these systems, especially the ones that have poor access and they can't help that. Because if you're in a capitated model, you already are incentivized to put the patients in the least cost environment. So you're, so it really hurts, like I'll just make up, let's say you have a hospital with terrible primary care access, it's hard to recruit in, you're all working, a lot of people use emergency department, you're trying to deal with it, and now you're double penalized uh, for this. So I just hope we can avoid those. And I'm not saying that, that I know that those are included, but if they are, let's get away from them. Um, I, in fact, I in a capitated system, I'm not sure why you need to penalize and reward much behavior anyway, it should be built in. And then last, everybody's talked about it, but I've got to say it, the complexity is real. Let me just come at it from a physician standpoint. You know, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and even up into the 2000s, we made medicine more and more complex, longer algorithms, more exceptions, how we can deliver care, and I don't know why, but a very complex way. The real reason was people thought it was better quality. If we could um, do things really complex, bring in uh, tools that, that make it... Um, where we're trying to deliver the best care to the individual in front of us. But what happened is that increased quality, it increased cost, and it really decreased the quality because it's impossible to reproduce this easily. And the same thing can be true when we um, come with complex models that we're trying to do for payment reform. If we simplified it, it may be slightly more expensive right on the direct cost, but it's a lot less, um, lot less expensive in the in the long run, and easier to reproduce, less prone to error, easier to understand, easier to motivate the staff to do what we want them to do, which is focus on patient care. I know this has been said, uh, but I just take it one step further. That's it. Thanks. Thank you very much. And. So sometimes there is a little bit of overlap, but I actually find it really valuable to hear that the people have the same thoughts to the extent that there is that I think it's actually valuable for the board for those points to be emphasized. Um, uh, last but not least, Mike Fisher from the Healthcare Advocate. Uh, thank you, Chair Foster and um, and uh, Pat Jones, Director Jones. I, I, I really, um, I agree with what you just said. Um, it's really important to hear this conversation. It's it's not you know this whole effort is not just a um, certainly not a waste of time because I think whatever happens at the end of this I think there's a lot of clarifying that's come through. Um, you've heard me say it before and um, and I'm just going to say it again that it's premature to say that we should either do or not do ahead. Indeed, the decision of whether a head makes sense for Vermont is going to require a, a, a real detailed analysis of the costs, much of which, or, you know, or risks, much of which have been really explored today, and the benefits. I think it was Judy Fox who said it clearest, you know, what are the terms? Um, you know, is there an opportunity for a, an improvement of how Medicare participates in Vermont? Um, at the end of the day, that's the question, and um, I appreciate everyone who's spoken today uh, um, the, uh, from the provider community and uh, and Blue Cross, uh, and now for me, the healthcare advocate, the two non-providers uh, in this list. Um, I, I agree with much of what's been expressed. Uh, some of the early panelists talked about um, the need for a broad all-in approach in the early days of the global budget tag, there was a lot of talk about that, uh, that in order for this to be successful, we had to have um, as, as much as possible, all providers and all payers participating. Um, you know, just to go back to the cost benefit analysis I just talked about, if only one or two Vermont hospitals are poised to participate, uh, the potential benefits um, of an enhanced Medicare payment would be that much less. So th that will feed into and the analysis. Um, I agree with the concerns expressed earlier um, and just now by Trey Dobson that um, 
um, that the push to reduce avoidable care um, has its risks. And, and I'll, I'll just say from an advocate's perspective, um, in the absence of a non-hospital, uh, of an adequate non-hospital provider system, uh, the push to reduce avoidable care in the hospital system uh, could easily result in pushing people to an absence of care. Um, obviously, I'm going to say, I need to say clear and upfront that uh, yes, from our perspective, affordability and access is key here. At the end of the day, this has to be experienced as an improvement to the Vermonters who struggle to get and stay healthy. Um, I think it was Blue Cross who said it clearest earlier. Um, it's essential that we establish a clear data collection and analysis methodology to be able to analyze whether the model is having a causal impact on the outcomes for Vermonters. What hasn't been said earlier is that I fear or I believe we're not set up to do this. And I fear that we won't be set up to really do this kind of analysis. So that's a concern of mine. It's really hard to answer the question of what we would or could be doing if we were not working on this uh, head model. You know, the, the what is the plan B? Um, I think there's been a lot of discussion earlier today about uh, many things that um, need our attention. And I'll just say, I'll just sort of recognize hmm, people know uh, my origin is as a frontline um, social worker. So I go back to my roots. Um, there are things we're doing that we're maybe only scratching the surface on uh, that we could be doing a lot more of. Um, a, you know, a, as an example, a SASH or a SASH like model, low tech, simple bringing care and care coordination to where people are. Um, if we did more of that, uh, I'm talking many fold more of that, um, I'm confident we would have good outcomes. We would improve care. I want to just name a dynamic uh, that's right, clearly right in front of us. Um, many of us, maybe all of us here have heard each of the board members, each of you talk about your concerns. Honestly, some of the same concerns expressed here today. As the administration approaches the negotiation with the federal government, they need to have an honest and clear assessment of whether there's going to be a path to a majority vote in favor of what comes out at the end of the negotiation. It would be a, a shame to put all that time in um, if there's a hard stop at the end. And, it, and I'm not suggesting that there doesn't need to be a hard stop. I'm just recognizing the dynamic. Um, the, the challenge with the concept I set up front that the deliverable has to be worth the effort is a recognition um, that it will take, that it is taking many millions of dollars of contractors time on top of the efforts of everyone in this room and more to get to a place where we know those details. After 10,000 hours of Pat's time, Pat, I don't know how you have that much time, and all of the other efforts, um, we need to be ready to walk away if this isn't right. That's not gonna be easy, but it, it, it really needs to be said um, that we need, to be, um, we need to be ready for that. We'll recognize it as a potential outcome. Um, finally, um, the last point I'll make is, uh, is a, what's the rush? I know there has been a, a decision from the very beginning that we needed to be, that we should be in cohort one. And, um, and so I just ask that question, um, as we do this very, very tough analysis and consider uh, all the complexity, um, does it make sense for us to be in cohort one? Is there a scenario where, um, you know what, to get it right, to really evaluate whether it makes sense for Vermont, it's going to take us more time. Thank you, board members and everyone here. I really appreciate the conversation. Thank you. 
Um, I have a couple of questions and thoughts and things to share with the group, but I'll open it up to the other board members um, first. I can jump in. Thank you everyone for joining us uh, today. It's always uh, interesting to hear everyone's perspectives. And as the chair mentioned earlier, where there are common shared thoughts and where folks differ. Um, and I don't really expect people to answer this today, but one thing that would be super helpful from my perspective is to get people's perspective on um, a topic that one presenter brought up, which is how doable is healthcare reform without Medicare participation? A again, that requires some thought, but I think that is the question that we also need to start thinking about moving forward over the next year um, as we develop more information about the AHEAD model. So I'll just throw that out there now so people have time to start thinking about that. Thank you. I could pop in. <clears throat> I think I have nine pages of notes. Um, just can't express the appreciation enough for everybody to take all the time and sit through this hearing with us all and, and share your perspectives. Um, I, don't know, I, I kind of, as I was going through thinking, maybe I would just highlight a few things and, and, and just things that caught my eye at the time. But, um, you know, Dr. Jacobs, and Rick Dooley, um, especially, but also uh, Justin Barnard and Mary Kate, and, um, John, the, just really the, the importance of primary care, the need to support primary care ahead, no ahead. Um, I, I'm sure Trey agrees with me working in the emergency departments that primary care access has really been a, a huge challenge lately and the importance of high quality primary care and and I and I feel strongly about advanced primary care in our healthcare system is is just it's foundational so um but I guess that's maybe that's where I'll leave it I I really appreciate everybody everybody taking the time and putting in the analysis and the thought and I hope this is the start of a conversation that continues um, because clearly um, there is not um, an easy right answer in this scenario, and there's a lot of steps to get to what is the potential best case scenario from ahead. And and also, I think, really thinking about, um, I, 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 several people mentioned this idea, but um, not, not so much a plan B, but what is going to be the plan for hospitals and parts of the system that are not participating in a head from the get go? Uh, maybe they develop, maybe they come into a head, but there's there needs to be some. We need to have some rational idea of of what of of where those parts of our system are going to lay with regards to Medicare and the other components. So, thank you, everyone. I think it, it, in the interest of time, and I know everybody has been so patient and and um, this has been such a fruitful conversation. I just wanna, I think I'll just say, I so appreciated everybody's thoughtful insights, the concerns and the gratitude um, that was expressed by everybody. I think we heard this several times, it's complex and there's so much more that we have to learn um, and your insights and some, I, I too have, pages and pages and pages of notes here. So I appreciate that. And I will be looking back at that. I think the comments here um, will help us all ask better questions, um, do better analyses and potentially either negotiate a better deal or know better when to walk away. So I, I just wanna express my, my gratitude for all of that. And I think this is gonna help us tremendously. And I hope this is not the end of this conversation. As we learn more, as we have more of these public meetings, I hope that there'll be more participation um, in those meetings or sending public comments separately. Help us from your perspective, um, make the best decision for Vermonters. So I, just expressing my gratitude 
and uh, we have a lot of work to do. Thank you. I'd like to take a moment to express my gratitude as well for all of you spending time with us uh, this afternoon and uh, the amount of thinking that you've put in preparing for this meeting. And um, like my colleagues, pages and pages of notes. Um, and I heard consistent themes about the complexity of the model that we're looking at, um, how burdensome that may be. Um, I heard consistent themes about the, the need throughout our state to be focused on primary care, mental health, some substance use disorders, um, and affordability and access. Um, and hearing those consistently brought forth, um, I think will help us stay focused on those top issues as we move forward. So thank you all for your time. Um, I'm just going to share a couple quick thoughts. Um, it's We've been hearing for years how successful the CPR program is, how much of a lifeline and support it is for our primary care. And then I heard so much about the complexity and the burden and, and the risk of the AHEAD model. And I, I, I really, it's kind of consistent theme. And I thought about the success of CPR and it's really quite a low tech program. It's a very, very simplistic low tech solution that we hear routinely is incredibly supported by the provider community. Um, low risk, low tech, highly effective, short dollars, very, very short dollars. And yet everyone really, really raves about how critically important it is. Kind of similar with Blueprint and Sash, not incredibly expensive for the bang for our buck that we've been getting as a state out of those programs. Um, there's a lot of information about, well, this program doesn't do this and we need this. And you know there's gonna be all these downsides. But from our decision, when ultimately we have to make votes and decisions on this, even if it doesn't do the ultimate calculus is what are the costs if you don't do it and what are the benefits, right? Like how's that play out? So at some point, whenever anyone wants to reach out or talk to me and I'm always around, um, I'd be curious about how we view and should evaluate the costs of losing the waivers, the costs of losing the primary care money, the potential costs of losing the Medicare savings money, which God only knows how much it will actually be and how it will actually flow and how it will be realized, and the costs of losing the flexibility, the predictability, and the savings if there are potentially votable use. So putting those components together, the costs, and then what we're actually going to lose if we don't do it is sort of where I get a little bit stuck. Um, I think on the flexibility, predictability, um, transformation, I have to say that at this point, I'm less bullish on those than I was nine months ago. And I say that because at this point, you know, two hospitals have non-binding letters of intent. There hasn't been overwhelming interest um, from the commercial insurance side or from the hospital side necessarily, maybe for great reasons. But the scope of this is quite narrow. And then as to Medicare money, uh, it's looking pretty, pretty slim. So if it's 65% is sort of the rough estimate of driving change and opportunity to actually transform and change incentives, we're quite a bit below that. So as you know, the chair of the care board, I start to think about how much money we're spending on this and the time we're spending and our staff that we're spending and Ms. Jones and everyone at AHS. And I do worry about something I think um, Blue Cross and the HCA and others said, which is the politics of spending millions of dollars investigating and understanding this and making sure that we all keep an open mind that it could be the right thing to do and do it if it is, but also walk away from having spent millions of dollars and hundreds, if not th thousands of hours of our own time doing it. And that might be a really painful decision, um, but the other decisions we might have to do it even if it doesn't solve every problem we all know exists. So uh, that's in the back of my mind as I sit here and work with everybody. Um, the only uh, the comment about discernible changes in outcomes, I think that's really important. We have to plan for that and allocate for that and provide resources for that. We didn't have it in the all payer model, and we need to make sure we're thinking about that going forward. The regulatory burden and all of that will be very expensive to set up. We don't have the resources at the board. Hospitals and providers don't have the resources to on it. It's a very small impact. 
Um, the last thing I'd say is that in terms of plan B, I think plan A is hospital transformation of the 167 work. Um, I think it's really, really critical to understand what gaps we have, how they can be filled, and where there's overlap and opportunity to save money in terms of our infrastructure. So I've always viewed that as plan A and being maybe the most important thing we do in the short term. Um, and the other thing I'd say is I'm curious what people think should be alternatives that we should be investigating and thinking about. Um, is it rate setting? Is it reference-based pricing? Is it site neutral payment? Is it simply trying to get Medicare to pay better for primary care or for preventative care or for services? Um, so I'd be curious on any thoughts on that topic as well. Um, but that's really all I had. And I did want to echo everyone's incredible appreciation for what you all did for us today. Uh, Tom? You're muted, Tom. Sorry. Um, if we're going to be asking this group to help us help with our thinking, um, one of the things that I'd appreciate help thinking about, um, the all-payer model tied some successful program, funding for some successful programs. Um, it, it blended all that together. The CPR, Blueprint, SASH um, was dependent upon having um, an, an accountable care organization and participating in the all payment model. Um, funding through AHEAD would continue supporting those programs. If we're not selected for the AHEAD model or we choose not to participate, what other funding mechanisms could make up those losses? How could we continue these programs um, if we are not participating in a CMS program? Um, I think being selected is uncertain. Our choice to participate, if we want negotiations to reflect our needs, um, these are non trivial risks that we will not participate. Uh, we will not be a participant with the AHEAD model, and that may uh, compromise some of the financial support received by the CPR program, Blueprint, and SASH. So what mechanisms can we con come up with to continue funding those? Um, I think we should be spending some time thinking about that. And I welcome any um, phone calls, emails, thoughts about that. Right. If if we don't do this, we will lose a lot of things people really value and appreciate um, that we've had through the ACO model. Um, I'll take um, public comment via the raise the hand function. If there is any. Ms. Goodwin? Yeah, I just I, want to say this was a, a great, another great discussion. And I do appreciate the, um, the board for taking all these comments in uh, and listening to them intently and taking notes and so forth. I am encouraged. I have great hope that that Vermont really is going to get the best system because of just this, the input that you're receiving from multiple areas of the healthcare system. So thank you. Thank you very much, Sharon. Any other comments? It probably won't be, be much because we had 14 panelists. I don't see any else. So everyone, thank you. And um, we're around email, phone call, whenever you have thoughts and you just want to share them with us, please, please continue to do so. And thank you. All right. Um, any older new business for the board? And is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. Bye. 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 We're adjourned. Thank you. Have a nice afternoon.